So we're going to pick up where we left off in class. Um, we finished talking about cerebral palsy, so we're going to continue on with meningitis through the rest of the chapter. Okay, so let's look at this. Meningitis, guys, is inflammation of the meninges. We looked last class that the meninges were a special covering that went around the brain that offered protection. Um, this is usually resulting from sort of some sort of infection. Um, the cerebral spinal fluid may also be affected due to the meninges being inflamed. There are several causes for meningitis. Um, it could be bacterial meningitis. If you have bacterial meningitis, there's a couple of different culprits. Um, they are listed here um, for you, but if you'll notice, um, the first one does have meninges in the name, so this is one that's going to affect the meninges for the most part. But the next one is a type of pneumonia right here. When you look at streptococcus pneumonia, this one normally would make you have pneumonia. However, it could affect your meninges. And then this other one is a, this other one's a bacteria that mimics the flu, which is an influenza type bacteria. So that's what we're looking at here. We also can have viral meningitis. Um, viral meningitis could be caused by measles, the flu, herpes, um, enterovirus. There could also be meningitis due to tumors that are present and even allergies could trigger meningitis. So infection or an irritant will trigger the inflammation process. This leads to swelling of the meninges. If the meninges swell, remember in your brain case, there's only so much room. This can increase intracranial pressure on your brain because there's only so much room in your um, head. When we look at this, some risk factors, being less than 25 years of age, so being if you're younger, you're at a higher risk of meningitis. Living in a community setting, meaning that there are people that you are around constantly can actually increase your chances of getting meningitis pregnancy, working with animals, and even and even some immunodeficiencies could lead to meningitis due to the immune system um, being altered. So meningitis, guys, is normally self-limiting if it's viral, meaning it's going to have to run its course and then it'll eventually go away. However, it could be life-threatening, and this is going to be more in your cases of the bacterial type infection. If it is life-threatening and we see that there could be some complications that come up, you could end up getting permanent neurological damage, seizures, hearing loss, blindness, speech difficulties, learning disabilities. There could also be behavior problems, paralysis, renal failure where the kidneys start to shut down, adrenal gland failure, shock, and then ultimately death. Okay, so it can be a very serious um, type of infection. So how does meningitis look? Well, it comes with fever, chills, um, mental status may be changed based on like their judgment, a little bit of personality, the fact that they may not be as alert, uh, nausea, vomiting, photophobia, where they um, don't want to be around light, so it hurts their eyes, severe headache. Um, one of the most cardinal signs for meningitis is a stiff neck. It causes the neck to be very stiff. Agitation, um, if it's in a, in a baby, you may see bulging fontanelles, decreased consciousness. You may also see what we call ipsotonus. This is abnormal positioning that involves rigidity and severe arcing of the back and the head being thrown backwards. And so it causes it to kind of come back like this where you're throwing the head and back backwards. Uh, poor feeding or irritability in children, tachypenia, and it could also cause rash and another word for rash is petechiae okay that it could cause a rash on the skin diagnosis of course we need to do a history a physical examination may did you do throat cultures because sometimes if you look at the some of the causes it could have started as an infection in the throat they may do a lumbar puncture this is to get the cerebral spinal fluid out so they can analyze it and see if an infection is present um, they will look at polymerase chain reaction tests to determine if it's a virus or bacteria. And then, of course, also a head CT to make sure there's no tumors or also to make sure there's been no damage to the brain yet. So treatment. The treatment is going to depend on the underlying cause. So it's important to know what's causing the meningitis. If it is bacterial, antibiotics are going to be used for treatment. Um, if it's viral, you're going to have to just support the body as it goes through that. Um, hide, be keeping this, the patient hydrated, uh, fever management so their fever doesn't get too high, and then vaccinations for some of the viral sites could help with prevention. It's not going to help necessarily with treatment, but it could help with prevention. All right, so now we're going to go into encephalitis. Encephalitis is inflammation of the brain and spinal cord itself. So it's not the meninges who are being inflamed, it's the brain itself. And this is normally from an infection. Some causes could be due to a virus like um, the Coxsackie virus, the echovirus, poliovirus, adenovirus, herpes virus, a cytomegalovirus. Um, you could also see the eastern equine encephalitis virus. That's going to come from horses. West Nile virus, St. Louis virus, measles, and mumps. So there's a lot of different viral 
um, strands that could potentially cause inflammation of the brain. There's some bacterial infections as well that can affect this area of the brain spinal cord, Lyme disease, which is carried by ticks, tuberculosis, and even syphilis, which is an STI, sexually transmitted infection. So guys, the infection triggers the inflammatory process that causes vasodilation. That dilation of the blood vessels, making them get bigger, increases the cap capillary permeability, so more of the fluid leaks out. Um, this also allows leukocytes to come in and um, do their job, which are the white blood cells, um, but because of that, it does trigger that inflammation process. The inflammatory process can cause nerve damage. Um, it can cause them to start to degenerate and diffuse brain and, and cause brain destruction, okay, is ultimately what it can do due to the inflammatory response, trying to get rid of the problem but it's causing damage to the brain in the process. So guys, encephalitis may be a primary type infection. This is where the virus or bacteria is a direct infection of the brain or spinal cord, or it could be secondary, where the bacteria traveled from somewhere else in the body to the brain. Most cases are mild and self-limiting because they are normally viral, uh, but they could be severe to life-threatening as well. Uh, vulnerable groups um, to a more severe progression of this type of um, in illness is those that are immune compromised. Uh, this could be individuals who are having cancer treatments. This could be individuals who um, have had transplants and they're on immunosuppressant drugs, um, individuals with HIV, um, young children and also older adults because younger children have not a very well developed um, immune system, whereas older uh, people start to see a decline in their immune system. Um, those living in high incidence areas, um, if it's carried by ticks with Lyme disease, you may see that more often. Um, West Nile virus is carried by mosquitoes, so again, it could be higher in some areas than others. And of course, those are frequently outdoors because most of these are going to use a vector of an insect in order to gain access into your body. Okay, and so that's one reason why it is going to be more frequently seen in people who spend times outdoors. So some complications for encephalitis, cerebral edema. Um, we can also see that cerebral hemorrhage, that's where the brain does start to bleed. And then of course, brain damage is ultimately the culprit of both of these, the edema and the hemorrhaging. So this can result from meningeal irritation and neurological damage. And so when we look at this, encephalitis could be a, a secondary cause of meningitis. It is similar to meningitis, but with a more gradual onset, it doesn't come on as quickly as meningitis does. Most cases are mild and they actually go undetected for the most part. Manifestations include, could be flu-like symptoms, so you just kind of feel like you have a cold, headache, neck rigidity, confusion. Could also cause the hallucinations in your more severe cases, personality changes, diplopia, which is double vision, seizures, muscle weakness, uh, parathesis, remember, is like that tingling, pins and needles type feeling. Um, this could lead to paralysis, loss of consciousness, tremors, abnormal deep tendon reflexes. The reflexes are a lot more exaggerated, rash and bulging fontanelles in so how do we diagnose encephalitis? We take a history, do a physical exam, of course a head CT, a head MRI. They also may do an electroencephalogram where they're going to look at the brain waves. A lumbar puncture with the cerebral spinal fluid analysis. Um, this could help us rule out meningitis. However, it could say that encephalitis could be due to meningitis. A polymerase chain reaction, again, to see what type of virus. And then serum antiviral antibodies. This will let us know which one your body is trying to fight. All right, so treatment for encephalitis because it is usually self-limiting, it doesn't require really much treatment, but it would be something like rest, adequate nutrition. This could be to help make sure that your immune system has what it needs to continue to fight the infection. Uh, reorientation and emotional support, because remember this could cause confusion, hallucination, so it would be helpful to have somebody to help them be able to get through those issues. Um, Analgesics and antipyretics, this will relieve the headaches and the fever, so this is anti-pain and also anti-fever drugs. Antiviral agents, if it is viral, this is again just to help uh, support your, your body so that it can fight the viral infection. Um, if it's bacterial, of course, we would need antibiotic therapy. Corticosteroids could help reduce the edema, the swelling. Um, Anti-seizure agents, if we see that they are having seizures due to the encephalitis, you may need to give them those. Sedatives to treat irritability and restlessness. Uh, 
physical speech or occupational therapy, again, depending on the severity and if there's some brain damage involved. Um, there are some preventative measures, though, that can help with encephalitis. One are vaccines, since a lot of this could be caused by viruses. Vaccinating could help decrease your chances of, of getting these types of encephalitis. Um, wearing protective clothing when you're outside. Um, wearing the proper gear, like when you go hiking, horseback riding, things like that, um, so that you're less likely to get those bugs on you, for one, or have them bite you. Um, using mosquito repellent and again eliminating water sources. A lot of these are going to reproduce in standing water so if you eliminate their chance of reproduction in that standing water you can limit the amount of insects in that area. All right, so these were the infections. So we had the meningitis, the encephalitis, that sort of thing. Now we're going to kind of switch gears and go into traumatic brain injuries. So when we look at traumatic brain injuries, these are usually caused by a sudden or violent blow or jolt to the head. Um, it could be a closed in injury um, or a penetrating injury, which is an open injury where there's a head wound. There's a number of different ways this can happen. You can get head injuries playing certain sports. You can get head injuries from falling. Um, car accidents, gunshot wounds. There's a lot of different things that can cause traumatic brain injuries. The energy, it, the injury can bruise the brain. It could damage nerve fibers or even cause hemorrhaging, which again is bleeding. Again, causes could be falls, motor vehicle accidents, penetration of an object, and even assaults. Um, they can vary from very mild brain injuries to very severe. Um, the persons who are at the highest risk are normally males, um, children zero to four years of age. Now, this could be this is due to the fact that they can't necessarily hold their head up themselves, and with falling, and, and even they're learning how to walk and things like that. And then we see another increase in with adolescents 15 to 19. Um, this again is due to a lot of times contact sports, but it can also be due to driver's license in those age, so more car accidents for those ages, as well as potentially just fights and things like that. And then again adults 75 years of age or older because they become in they become unstable when they walk and again falls are a lot bigger um, issue for them uh, certain military personnel people like paratroopers who jump out of planes and things like that they're putting their body at more risk of potentially um, hitting their head and their parachutes not working things like that so it puts them at a higher risk and then African Americans African Americans actually have the highest death rates when it comes to traumatic brain injuries all right, so in your textbook, there's a number of pictures that kind of show you. Um, there's a forward, backward, closed head injury here um, where the head, where the, we see that the brain is going to hit, move kind of forward, and then hit back again, the back part of the uh, skull, a side-to-side -side brain injury. This would be like, kind of like if you were T-boned or something like that. Um, we also see that you could have an impact where you bruise both sides of the head, where it, they hit the front and the back, so it has what we call a counter coupery type of injury, where both sides are hindered or hurt. And then down here you have a depressed fracture where something did a blow to the head, which um, fractured the skull, but also hurt the brain. So we have some traumatic brain injuries. This picture is located in your textbook on page 350 and 351. Now, when we look at traumatic brain injuries, there are some complications that can come into play. They can occur from one significant event or multiple mild events. So it could be one main thing that could cause the issue, or it could be small things over time. And this is um, one reason why there's a lot of precautions now with um, with concussions because it could be a process where a lot of little concussions can cause major problems. Um, they can cause changes in your thinking, sensations in your body, language, or even your emotions. It could cause, cause the individual to develop seizures. Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, there's actually been a link, or at least I think there might be a link, that individuals who develop these two diseases later in life um, have had a traumatic brain injury in the past, which made them more prone. Uh, memory decline, depression, and then even death if the injury is severe enough. All right, so some conditions associated with closed traumatic brain injury. So TBI is traumatic brain injury here. The first one is a concussion. Guys, a concussion is a momentary interruption of brain function. It could last only for maybe a couple of seconds to about a minute or so, um, but the person usually comes out of it very quickly. It usually results from a mild blow to the head. This causes sudden movement of the brain, disrupting some neurological function in the process. It may or not, may or may not lead to the loss of consciousness. So the person may pass out, but they may not in this. It could also cause um, in amnesia, 
confusion, sleep disturbances and headaches, um, and these may occur for weeks or months after the injury. Um, it also could cause memory lapses where they don't remember what happened during that, that time when the injury took place. So there's a number of different things that can happen and some of these do last for extended periods of time after the potential concussion. Again though, this is one reason why, especially in teens, if you played certain sports now, um, they take a test at the very beginning of participating in the sport, and this is what they would call their concussion test, and it gives them kind of a baseline of how the student does on it. And then if they are thought to have a concussion, they have to take this test again. If they score lower, they are not going to be released to go back to playing. And this is to hopefully reduce some of these long-term effects of potentially confusion, memory loss, things like that. All right, so taking a step up from a concussion would be a cerebral contusion. This is where the brain actually gets bruised in the process. This may result from a blunt blow. It could cause the brain to make a sudden impact with the skull itself. Um, a coup is the initial area the brain impacts the skull. So if, I, if you got in an accident and you had some whiplash and you went forward and then back, the coup would be when the brain hits the front part of the skull. And then counter coup would be if you went backwards and it hit the back side of your skull. It's that rebounding effect effect um, from the brain bouncing from one side to the other. Um, again, these can vary in their severity depending on the extent of the damage and the amount of bleeding because if it's bruised, there's some bleeding that took place. Residual effects, again, depend, depend on the severity of the injury. Okay, so you could have memory loss, you could have um, personality changes, but again, it also depends on what part of the brain was also hurt. Um, we can take it a step further and we go into what we call fractures and this is going to be where you change it from closed traumatic brain injuries to open. This may be a linear skull fracture. It could be a comminuted. Remember, it is lots of pieces of the skull or a compound fracture. Um, skin's actually broken. A depressed fracture. Okay. Um, or a basilar skull fracture. Skull, there's a lot of different ways that we could fra fracture our skull, ultimately hindering the brain and making it exposed to the outside world as well as damage. So this is why one of the main complications with a fracture could be an infection, all right? Because then you're opening the skin normally in the area as well, which makes the brain tissue um, open to the outside, increasing the chance of infection. Now, when we look at traumatic brain injuries, they can have different manifestations. Um, they may be vague and develop very slowly, or they may be sudden and very severe in their development. Symptoms may improve um, for the patient, but then suddenly get a lot worse, depending on what type of brain injury is present. Um, the outward appearance of the head is not a true indication of the severity of the injury. Just because there's no uh, broken places or depressions on the head or anything, that does not mean that there is not a serious brain brain injury that has occurred. Okay, so the skull is not going to necessarily give you very good indication of how severe the brain injury might be. Um, some manifestations include not being able to recall the event details, like not being able to know exactly what happened to them as um, like they may be able to recall something before the event, but then they have some blank spaces and then after the event they can remember some things. Um, they may have um, indications of a contusion where there's actually bleeding that might be present. Their, their pupils could be different in sizes um, where one may react a lot faster than the other or they may be just different in size um, after the injury. Seizures may be a complication. Asymmetrical facial features, if one side of the body is that one side of the brain's affected more than the other, it could cause you to be manifested on the face where the face starts to droop or something like that. Uh, fluid draining from the nose, mouth, or ears. Um, fracture in the skull or face. Bruising of the face. Swelling at the side of the injury. So we see swelling there. A scalp wound. Impaired hearing, smell, taste, speech, or vision. Could all be different manifestations. Um, inability to move one or more of your limbs, irritability, especially in children, personality changes, unusual behaviors, loss of consciousness. Um, we also see they could have bradypenia. Brady means slow, penia means breathing. Hypotension, where their blood pressure is low. Restlessness, lack of coordination, lethargy, stiff neck, and even vomiting. So these are all different types of manifestations that traumatic brain injuries can have. 
So how do we diagnose a, brain, a traumatic brain injury? First, a history, a physical examination. Um, this includes using what we call the Glasgow Coma Scale. Um, this scale, which I'll show you in a minute, is also found in your textbook. It has different things that you look at for the patient, and they score points depending on their level of points. tells you the severity of their injury or where they kind of are based on a coma or being alert. Um, this is really important because if they score a certain level on the scale at one point, but then you come back and they score worse, then it could be that there could be a brain bleed or something like that where continued damage is being done to their brain. A head CT, a head MRI, and then also monitoring their intracranial pressure. So ICP is the intracranial pressure. So what's some treatment of traumatic brain injuries? It could be rest, um, analgesics, which we may see as um, different painkillers like um, acetaminophen, like Tylenol. They may use cold compresses, osmotic diuretics um, to help keep extra fluid off, the swelling off that area of the brain, anti-seizure agents, sedatives, surgery. Um, they may need rehabilitation like physical speech or occupational therapy. Again, that depends on how much of the brain has been damaged due to the traumatic brain injury. So guys, here is the Glasgow um, Coma Scale. Um, when you look at this, you're gonna look at the um, eye opening first. Do they open their eyes spontaneously? Um, that'll give them four points. If they open their voice to your voice, that's three. If they open them to pain, that's two. And if there's no response where they do not open their eye, they do get one point. Um, best verbal responses, are they oriented and do they converse with you like they know what's going on, that's five. Are they disoriented but they're still trying to talk to you, that's four. If they're using inappropriate words, now this doesn't necessarily mean bad language, this is, could be where they're trying to tell you something but they're, they're picking the wrong words out, um, they would get a three. If they have incomprehensible sounds, like they may be trying to communicate with you but no words are coming out, they're grunting, groaning, things like that, it's a two. If there's no response because they're also intubated, they can't necessarily talk to you, it's a one. Um, then they'll look at motor responses. If they can follow your commands like raise this hand, squeeze this hand, touch this finger to this, this area, they can actually get six points. If it local, they have a localized response where they can push away from the stimulus, like if you're hurting them or something like that, they get five. If they will withdraw from the pain, they can get four. Um, abnormal flexion, we can call this what we call a decorditate. We'll look at what these mean in a minute. They get three points. If they have abnormal um, extension, this one is two points. And then if there's no response, there is one point. So guys, if you'll notice on the scale, you cannot get a zero. But you, if you have three points, then you're in a coma. There's no response in any of these three areas, and so the lowest you can get on this is a three. Um, the higher you get, the better the score, okay? The closer you are to being more normal, okay, with the higher score that you get. So guys, how can we prevent some of these brain injuries? Well, for one, wearing a seatbelt when you're driving um, or riding in a motor vehicle is one of the best ways to help prevent some of this. Um, using appropriate child safety, safety seats in the car, uh, making sure that they're installed correctly and being used properly. Um, wearing a helmet when appropriate, so like when you're playing certain sports like football, um, if you're riding a bicycle or skating, you should wear a helmet to help protect your head. Um, making the home also safe. This is really important like for the little kids, but also for the elderly, like removing any tripping hazards, having adequate lighting, um, using safety gates to prevent like around stairs so that they don't use the stairs if they don't need to, um, storing firearms in a locked cabinet, not keeping them out where kids can get a hold of them or even sometimes other adults who don't know how to use them, um, never driving impaired or under the influence, um, supervising children when they're playing, don't just let them go play, make sure you're supervising them to make sure that, that injuries don't occur. Okay, so these are all different ways that we can try to help prevent traumatic, traumatic brain injuries, right? So if you, um, some of us, and you may have already, you may have had one, you might have the more mild form. I've had several concussions growing up. Um, they didn't have those precautions as much when I played basketball as they do now. Um, and there are times that I don't remember certain things that happen. People would tell me, oh, you did this, or I'd watch film and I didn't even realize I had done that, um, just even from the memory loss of just a simple concussion. And so most people have had some sort of traumatic brain injury in their lifetime. All right, so this brings us to increased intracranial pressure. So guys, your head only has so much room for everything because of it being a closed skull. So about 80% of the room is taken up by um, brain tissue. About 10% is by blood 
and 15% cerebral spinal fluid. Now those are estimates. The blood and cerebral spinal fluid, they change periodically as they come in and out to try to help make sure that they sell, stay relatively within a certain limit so that we aren't putting too much pressure on the brain. Now, if these change in any way and there's increased volume in the cranial cavity, um, it could potentially cause increased intracranial pressure. Now there's a number of causes. A traumatic brain injury could be a cause, a brain tumor, hydrocephalus, cerebral edema, or even hemorrhage. So we've talked about majority of these already and they can cause increased intracranial pressure. Now there is a hypothesis out there related to increased intracranial pressure. It's called the monroe keeley hypothesis. This says the increase in volume of one compartment must be compensated by decreasing the volume in another because there is only so much room. If one increases, the other has to decrease to make sure that it does not increase the pressure as a whole. Now, this is accomplished mostly by shifting um, the cerebral spinal fluid or the blood in different ways because we can't really shift or get rid of the brain tissue because then that causes brain damage. And so we see that the blood and the cerebral spinal fluid are the two that are going to have to help compensate for an intracranial pressure um, change. So there are two compensatory mechanisms that can help compensate for these changes in intracranial pressure. One is called an autoregulation. This is where the blood vessels will dilate to increase blood flow and constrict if ICP is too high. Okay, so if the blood, if the pressure is too low in the brain, then these blood vessels will dilate, they'll get bigger, so more blood can come in, raising the pressure. If the pressure gets too high, we see that they will constrict, they'll get smaller, so that way we don't get too much blood in the air. Area. Okay, so this will help ultimately decrease intracranial pressure. On the other hand, there's also one causing called the Cushing reflex. Um, this is where the hypothalamus increases its sympathetic stimulation um, when the mean arterial pressure drops below the intracranial pressure. This will cause vasoconstriction in the blood vessels, increase cardiac contractibility, making the heart contract harder. And this will also then increase the amount of cardiac output, the amount of blood that's coming through. The Cushing triad, tri means three. So we see that the blood pressure does increase, okay? Blood pressure goes up. We also see that bradycardia will, will potentially happen. And then what we call um, Cheyenne Stokes respiration. This type of respiration is really fast, deep breathing, but will slowly, will start to slow down into um, eventually apnea. We'll start to slow down and eventually into apnea um, when we look at this Cheyenne Stokes respiratory uh, respiration. Now guys, if we look at this, you can see that this is what would happen um, if there's increased, in cranial, increased intracranial pressure. If we're gonna compensate for it, you're going to see that the blood pressure is going to start to um, increase. So you can see increasing pulse pressure is happening here. Um, the pulse, however, will start to decrease and so will respiration over time. If this continues to be a problem, if we're compensating and the body's working real hard and it's not being fixed for whatever reason, um, could be we do, haven't taken care of the underlying cause, um, that hasn't had any treatment, we will eventually see that the heart rate will continue to slow down until it eventually stops. Breathing will continue to slow down until it eventually stops. And then ultimately that causes more brain damage in the process. And so because of this, we want to fix it, but it needs to be fixed relatively quickly if we want to um, not overwork the heart, overwork the lungs, and potentially cause more brain damage. And this particular diagram is found in your textbook on page 354. Now, when intracranial pressure happens and it starts to increase at a great deal, we see that there can be what we call herniation that takes place. Herniation is a complication of increased intracranial pressure, and there are several types depending on where the displacement of the brain tissue takes place. So the first one is what we call the transtentorial, or what we call central herniation. This is where the cerebral hemispheres, okay, so you have a right and a left side, cerebral hemispheres, the diencephalon, which is below, and the midbrain, all get pushed downward. So the pressure is going to be normally up the top, and it's pushing the whole brain downward. We also see that cerebral blood flow, um, cerebral spinal fluid, the reticular activation system, and respirations will start to become impaired. So blood flow is impaired, the cerebral spinal fluid will become impaired, the reticular activation center will become impaired, meaning that the person will potentially go into a coma, and then their respirations as well because we're putting pressure down on those vital centers into the brain stem. 
Another one is what we call a uncal or this type of human herniation is a hook-like anterior end of the hypocampal gyrus will start to move of the temporal lobe. It starts to shift downward past that tentorium cerebelli. Now, if you'll recall back in um, learning about the brain and anatomy, you had extensions of the dura mater, which gave separations or compartments that the brain tissue was supposed to stay in. The tentorium is going to be the one that separates the cerebral hemispheres, the top, from the cerebellum that smaller part of the brain here, and it's like a little tent between the two. What's happening here is the temporal lobe, which is on the side, starts to shift into that area, okay? It starts to shift there. So we see that it's going to potentially start putting pressure on that cerebellum. This puts pressure on also cranial nerve three, which is for the movement of the eye and also the um, pupils. Um, also the posterior cerebral artery, and the reticular activation system, which helps you with your sleep wakes, that sort of thing, and potentially could put the person in, again, a coma. Another one is the cerebellar, or this is where the cerebral tonsils, the rounded lobes of the undersurface of each cerebral hemisphere, get pushed downward through the foramen magnum. So we're actually pushing them down through that opening in the foramen magnum. This puts compression on the brainstem and vital centers, and this one is probably the most severe, that if it is not treated very quickly, it can cause death. Because what happens here is it breaks off those vital centers, stopping the heart, stopping the breathing, ultimately causing death. Now, in your textbook, this shows you um, pictures of each of these. Um, so if you take a look here at this picture, this kind of shows you the different types of herniation that can take place. Um, you can see here that there could be a tumor that causes the issue, there could be a blood clot, there could be any kind of thing that potentially could cause the herniation. Transtentoral herniation that pushes down here is the one that's coming down. I'll circle it right here and it's pushing, of course, down on the brain stem. The next one was the uncal herniation and it's already shown here and it's pushing over. So the brain shifting from one side to the other side when it shouldn't. Um, and then the last one, the cerebellar or what we call the tonsillar herniation is what we see here that we see here right here in this blue area where it's pushing into onto the brainstem, pushing into the brainstem area. All right, so these are the three different types of herniation. But guys, herniation is just where a piece of the brain here is going into an area that it shouldn't, which is ultimately gonna damage another area. So the pressure in one place is pushing the brain to where it's shifting and pushing into another place of the brain, causing major damage to the brain tissue. All right, so what are some manifestations? What are some signs that we can look at for increased intracranial pressure? So some general manifestations include decreased level of consciousness, um, vomiting, which is often projectile because that affects that vital center in the spinal cord, increased blood pressure with increased pulse pressure. However, we also see bradycardia where the heart rate starts to deteriorate. We also see papillae edema. This is where we see that there is edema around the optic disc of the eye. Um, it starts to swell. We see fixed or dilated pupils, and there's also going to be some posturing that takes place where the body starts to move in a certain kind of way due to the pressure on the brain. And we'll talk about these body postures in just a minute. In an infant, we also see that it could separate their sutures um, in, their, in their head, what should have started to um, develop and close, and it also could cause bulging of their fontanelles. Um, manifestations in older children and adults include behavior changes, especially if the frontal lobe is affected, severe headaches, lethargy, neurological deficits, and even seizures. So abnormal posturing, guys, this has been referred to a couple of times already in the notes, so I want to look at the two different types. And so if we look there, A and B are both marked, and then C is a combination of both, where one side of the body is in A and the other side is in B. So the first one, guys, is decortitate um, rigidity. This is where the upper arms are held at the sides, okay? So my upper arms are at my sides, my elbows are pulled in, okay? But they are also going to be flexed. So my elbows are flexed, my wrists are flexed, and so are my fingers. So everything is drawn in towards my chest, okay? That's what we're talking about here. Now the legs, on the other hand, are gonna be fully extended and internally rotated, meaning that the toes will be pointed inward. Okay, um, also the feet will be plantar flex, meaning that you're going to see that they're gonna be pointed. So their to toes will be pointed and turned inward. Okay, when we look at this type of um, posturing and we call this the decorticate. Decor rigid. The next one is the decelebrate rigidity and this one's where the jaws will become clenched 
we'll clench our jaws together. Their neck will be extended. Okay, so this is flexion. Extension is where it comes back. So their head will be extended. Okay, kind of back, teeth clenched. We see that their arms are going to be adducted, meaning that they're close to the sides of the body um, and stiffly extended at the elbow. So instead of being drawn in like we have here, they're gonna be extended down by the sides. Um, the elbows will be closed. The forearms will be pronated. Okay, so you're going to turn your arms out and the fingers will be flexed. So guys, the arm, and you can't really see it whenever I'm just sitting here, but the arm would be kind of like this. All right, so let me kind of stand up. And so it would be kind of like this off to the side and everything would be kind of pushed out like this. Okay. So hopefully I was able to show you that. All right. And then if we look at C here, it's a combination of both. If you look here, the right side of this person's body is in the decelebrate, but the other side, the left side, is in the decordiate. Now this could be due to the way that the brain is herniating and moving into the different areas, which causes abnormal partial abnormal posturing to where one side of the body is experiencing one thing and the other is experiencing another because remember those hemispheres um, control different sides of the body and if this one's pushing into the next one we may see changes that are a little bit different for each side all right so this is abnormal posturing because this is not how you would normally just lay there okay so that's what we call it abnormal posturing all right so increased intracranial pressure can be diagnosed, of course, with a history of physical exam. This does include looking at the Glasgow Coma Scale, head CT, and head MRI. This is going to be really important because these are going to actually show us if the brain has shifted into different areas and know what kind of potential herniation we may be seeing due to increased intracranial pressure. Also, we need to monitor this pressure because it can change from minute to minute based on the cerebral spinal fluid, the blood flow, things like that, or the swelling that's taking place in the brain. So it's really important that the intracranial pressure is constantly monitored. So how do we treat this? Treatment is gonna be depending on the underlying cause, okay? If it's due to a tumor, um, we may need to remove that. If it's due to a blood clot or a bleed, we need to stop that bleed, maybe remove the blood clot. Uh, we also need to provide respiratory support for the patient. Um, if the respiratory system becomes compromised and they cannot breathe, then of course, then death is going to soon follow, so we need to make sure that we support them on that. We also may need to put them in what we call semi-fowler's semi positioning. Um, this is where they're going to be positioned where they're laying at like a 30 to 45 degree angle all right um, so they're not sitting straight up but they're not also laying flat it's kind of putting them at an angle um, we may also use um, draining the excessive cerebral spinal fluid off of their body um, diuretics to help make sure they're not retaining too much fluid uh, corticosteroids may be important to help with the inflammation seizure precautions if it they're putting pressure on different parts of their brain it could cause them to have seizures and so we want to take those different precautions that are there um, some of these may be putting up the rails on the side of the bed, um, having a suction tube that's available if they have a seizure, but guys, it could also be to help prevent seizures, like having low light, low stimulation, um, to make sure that they're not going to be stimulated to have a seizure. Um, Anti-seizure agents, sedatives, um, we may also need to do stool softeners. Um, stool softeners are important because if their stool is too hard and they have to actually push to get their poop out a lot, it's going to cause intracranial pressure because when you push and you do that, it causes an increased pressure in the in the head. We may also see that they may need anti-ulcer agents. This would be due to stress, thermoregulation, and glucose management. So these are all different types of treatment to also help with that increased intracranial pressure. All right, so now we want to switch gears into a hematoma, okay, because intracranial pressure could be caused by everything we talked about so far, but it could also be caused due to a blood clot. So we want to take a look at what um, a bleed on the brain may look like. So a collection of blood in the tissue that develops under or from a ruptured blood vessels, what we call hematoma. Hematomas can develop immediately, especially if it's a tear in the artery, or they can develop slowly over time. Um, that would be more of a venous type of tear. They could be caused by a traumatic brain injury or even just a surgery itself where the blood vessel was damaged. So there's some different types of bleeds we want to look at. And the first one is an epidural bleed, hematoma. This results from bleeding between the dura and the skull. Um, this usually is caused by an atrial tear. So if it's an atrial tear, it's going to be a pretty fast bleed. Uh, manifestations include marked neurological dysfunction in the area where the blood is starting to press on the brain. Um, 
And this usually can develop within a few hours after the injury, very quickly. Um, the typical symptom pattern of an epidural hematoma is a brief loss of consciousness, followed by a short period of alertness where it seems like they're fine, and then there's loss of consciousness again. All right, so they're kind of in and out in this process. Another type of bleed is called a subdural hematoma. This one is going to develop between the dura and the arachnoid. So we're going a little deeper. Um, so between the dura and the arachnoid area in, in the meninges, this is frequently caused by a small venous tear. So it's usually going to develop slowly, okay? Gradually type start to develop where we see a pooling of the blood because the venous blood supply has less pressure to it. An acute subdermal hematoma manifests itself where it prevents with it it, pre, it presents within 24 hours of the injury. So it's not as quick. In an atrial bleed we saw within 2 to 3 hours we see issues. This one could be more than 24 hours before you see any problems. Um, it does then progress pretty rapidly after that point and it has a high mortality rate. And this is because most of the time it's left undetected until it is too late. With a subdermal hematoma, we see that there is increased intracranial pressure. This will increase over a period of time for about a week after the injury. And so again, this is a reason why a lot of times we don't realize that it's causing as much damage as it is. With chronic subdermal hematomas, manifestations develop several weeks after the injury um, because they continue to slowly leak. Um, they're more common in elderly adults because of their brain atrophy and getting a little bit smaller um, due to the aging process. Another one is an intracerebral hematoma. This is a result from bleeding in the brain tissue itself, so directly into that brain tissue area there's a bleed. This is caused by a contusion or shearing injury, but it can also result from hypertension, so high blood pressure that's left untreated, a cerebral vascular accident like a stroke, an aneurysm, which is a weakening in the blood vessel that causes a kind of ballooning of the blood vessel until it finally potentially can pop, or any kind of vascular abnormality where the blood vessel is not formed properly. Another one is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. This results from bleeding in the space between the arachnoid and the PM mater. The primary clinical presentation in this is a severe headache with a sudden onset, and it will worsen near the back of the head, okay? So it's severe headache, and then it starts to worsen towards the back of the head. All right, so if we take a look here, you have some different type of hematomas here shown in the picture. In A, you have a subdural, okay? So subdural is going to be underneath the dura, between the dura and the arachnoid, and you can see how it's putting pressure on the brain and it's actually causing herniation to take place of the brain tissue. Um, remember that the subdural is going to be a very slow bleed, but a lot of times we don't catch it until it's already too late, because look at all the damage that's happened in this picture. The next one is the intracerebral. This is the one that happens directly in the brain tissue, whether it's due to a stroke or an aneurysm, okay? And this other one over here on C is an epidural. It's between the brain, or it's between the dura that's shown in the blue and the skull. Again, if you'll notice, there is brain and the brain being pushed and some herniation that is taking place. All right, so these are just showing some different types of hematomas. And this picture is found on page 356 in your textbook. All right, so again, if we take a different look, you can actually see that you have an epidermal hematoma, a subdural, you may have an intracerebral. These are different ways you can look from on the scan. You can also see that the based on um, where the, the blood is kind of pooling, it's putting pressure on the brain and pushing it, and you can see that's where the arrows are going, which is also causing potential herniations to take place. Okay, and then over here on the right-hand side, you can actually see a... a um, brain scan that is showing you those potential bleeds and they're normally a lighter color than the rest of the brain tissue so you can see that there are some different ones like some cerebral contusions that are present which is where they're more of a bruise versus an epidermal hematoma that you can see that's labeled or a sub subarachnoid hemorrhage that's labeled here in the pictures now guys, hematoma is where the bleeding leads to localized pressure on nearby tissue. This increases intracranial pressure. The blood um, may coagulate and form a solid mass. Um, this then takes time to dissolve and get rid of, which can continue to put pressure on the, on the areas around it. The hematoma then becomes encapsulated by what we call fibroplasts. The blood cells within the capsule will start to lyse and break apart, which can potentially cause a toxic environment for the brain. 
Fluid from the hemolysis exerts osmotic pressure, drawing more fluid into the capsule. This, in, this increases edema, increasing the mass size, which also then increases intracranial pressure. Bleeding can also trigger vasospasms. Um, this can also cause a worsening of the ischemia to the blood vessels around the damage. Um, it's causing them to spasm and constrict, which then means that they're not getting blood to the brain tissue there that would have been fine, um, except for that it's due to the bleed. And then it also could result in herniation due to the pooling of the blood. So how do we diagnose a hematoma? Of course, we do a history physical exam. Again, this includes the Glasgow Coma Scale, a head CT, head MRI. Um, they may do a cerebral angiogram. When they do a cerebral angiogram, they're going to be looking at how the blood vessels are doing, maybe where the tears may be, whether it's an artery or a vein, um, maybe seeing if there's any way we need to fix it, if there's a stroke that has taken place. And also, they're going to measure the intracranial pressure, monitoring, make sure that it does not continue to increase. Now, what are some treatments for hematomas? Um, we may require no treatment or removal of the blood. Um, may not be possible depending on where it's located. Um, no treatment might be if it's a small issue and it's starting to clear up on its own, or if the bleed is too deep, there'd be too much damage done if we went in to try to retrieve the blood clot and get rid of it. Um, surgical removal of the blood through a burr hole may be a issue or a, an option, or what we call a craniectomy, where we're gonna actually open up part of the skull. So in a burr hole, guys, they just drill holes in the skull to allow the drainage of the extra blood or fluid. A craniotomy is we're going to take an actual bigger, larger piece of the skull off in order to um, get that pressure off the brain. Uh, speech, physical therapy, and occupational therapy may be required depending on the, where the damage may have been done due to the herniations or the bleed. Additional strategies similar to a um, traumatic brain injury or also increased intracranial pressure like respiratory management, seizure precautions, and even thermoregulation, especially if the brain stem has been involved. All right, so now we're gonna move down a little bit and we're gonna talk about spinal cord injuries. Now, spinal cord injuries, guys, result from a direct injury to the spinal cord or an indirect from damage to the surrounding bones, tissue, or blood vessels, okay? So the, sometimes it could be the spinal cord itself is injured due to the accident, or it could be that the bone has caused a disruption in, around the spinal cord, or it could be the tissue or blood supply is dying around the spinal cord, which ultimately affects it. Now, some causes are things like, some causes could be things like motor vehicle accidents, falls, violence, sports injuries, um, and even weakening of the vertebral structures due to rheumatoid arthritis or even osteoporosis that we saw in the last chapter. Direct damage can occur if the spinal cord gets pulled, okay, if it gets pulled too much, or if it gets pressed sideways, or if it gets compressed. So there's a lot of different ways. We can see it get pulled, it could get pushed, or it could get compressed and pushed down. This damage may occur if the head, neck, or back gets twisted in an abnormal way during the accident or the injury. All right, so when we're looking at spinal cord injuries, we do have some things that could happen within the spinal canal. Um, one would be a hemorrhage or fluid accumulation due to like excessive cerebral spinal fluid or swelling um, through edema could occur inside the spinal cord itself or outside the spinal cord, but it's still gonna happen within that vertebral canal or that spinal canal because there's only so much space in there and it could compress the spinal cord. This accumulation would compress the spinal cord, potentially damaging it, and it might not be reversible. There is something that's called spinal shock. This is temporary suppression of neurological function because of the spinal cord compression. What's wrong? Can you say hi to my class? Hi. <laughs> Are you shy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can listen to me talk? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So spinal shock is a temporary suppression of the neurological function. Um, this is because the spinal cord is compressed, maybe by that fluid or accumulation of a bleed or something like that. This neurologic function will gradually return over time. Um, spinal cord injuries are most common in Caucasians in males from age 15 to 35. So what are some complications with spinal cord injuries? First, you can have loss of neurologic functioning, varying degrees of paralysis. Now this paralysis is most likely to be flaccid paralysis where the muscles are not firing or functioning at all. 
Um, we can also see something called quadra equina syndrome. This is an injury to the nerve roots in the area of the quadra equina. If you recall, the spinal cord tapers off at L2, and then it spreads out to those nerve roots to the rest of the spinal um, canal. And so this would be damage below the L2 region. We also see something that can happen with injuries that are above the T6 area um, that go above that more of the high thoracic and cervical area and it's called autonomic hyperreflexia. This is a massive sympathetic response to the injury. This can cause the individual to have headaches, hypertension due to high, the high blood pressure and the, and the um, heart beating too quickly with tachycardia, seizures, stroke, and it could result in potentially death. There's also something else that we call neurogenic shock. This is an abno abnormal vasomotor response that's secondary to a disruption in the sympathetic impulses. So in this damage, it could be in an area where the sympathetic nervous system is, is being compromised in some way, which causes vaso vasomotor responses. Um, another complication would be respiratory failure. Again, it depends on the area or the um, location of the spinal cord injury. The higher you are, the more complication you potentially have with the respiratory um, system. Also, you would have immobility. This could be both legs. It could be arms and legs. Um, this could also contribute to constipation, pulmonary infections, urinary infections, thrombosis, where blood clots may form in the leg and, and move to other areas, impaired skin integrity, since you're putting pressure on areas you normally wouldn't, and then potential contractors of the muscles. There's also could be changes in bowel and bladder function. Again, this, if, if, this is if the injury is above that area. And then sexual dysfunction as well as chronic pain and ultimately death in some cases. Now death is going to be a complication, especially if it's a high cervical injury, especially near the, if it's near the uh, brain stem. All right, so let's take a look at these. Cervical injuries can occur, um, cervical injuries can affect both the upper and lower extremities, and they can include breathing difficulties, loss of normal bowel and bladder control, parathesis, remember tingling or pins and needles, sensory changes, spasticity, pain, weakness, paralysis, blood pressure instability, temperature fluctuations, and um, diaphoresis, which is sweating. Um, so when we look at this, guys, with cervical injuries, you're going to have anything pretty much below that injury point being affected. When we go to thoracic injuries, these will normally affect the lower extremities, and the manifestations could be the same as those of cervical injuries, depending, again, on the location. In lumbar sacral injuries, it can affect the lower extremities, extremities in varying degrees. They may not have a lot of movement in their legs, but they may have some feeling. They may be able to control a little bit of movement. And manifestations, again, can be similar, similar to those in cervical injuries like bowel and bladder control, um, changes in sensory perception, things like that. Um, the only thing you won't see here is you won't have breathing difficulties because the injury is below those points that control breathing. So guys, when we look at spinal cord injuries, when we diagnose them, of course, we're going to take a history, a physical exam. This does include a neurological assessment, um, a spinal CT, a spinal MRI would maybe need to be done. And these are a lot of times going to be looking at the swelling. It may also look to see if the spinal cord is severed, those types of things. Um, a spinal x-ray to make sure that the bones and the canal are okay. And then a spinal meliogram. <clears throat> which is an x-ray with some special dye to see how where the damage may completely be located. We also see that the American Spinal Injury Association um, has an impairment scale and I showed it, I listed it over here. Um, you have an A, B, C, D, and E that are here. Um, a is complete, meaning there's no motor or sensory function in this particular case. Um, you could say B here is incomplete sensory but not motor function in that segment. Um, C would be also an incomplete where motor functions preserve below the neurologic level. D is another incomplete. And then E is going to be where motor and sensory function is normal. So in this case, the lower you get in the alphabet, the better the chances are for that injury. Okay, and so when we look at this, this is what you're kind of seeing when they kind of grade a spinal cord injury. 
So how do we treat spinal cord injuries? The first is immediately we need to mobilize the spine, making sure that we don't potentially con con cause more damage in the area. Corticosteroid agents may be needed to reduce swelling. Spinal traction to reduce the fracture and mobilize the spine. And so remember tractions where if it's up here, they may put your head in traction and pull to elongate the spine. If it's in the lumbar area, they would put the harness around the hips and pull that direction. Um, surgical repair of the, if there's a fracture may need to be done or removal of fluid to help um, relieve the compression on the spine. Um, we may also see respiratory management. And remember, this is really important. So sometimes they may not have difficulty at the time, but we may need to go ahead and put them in respiratory management so that they're intubated, that sort of thing, to make sure that they don't, they don't start to have struggles while we do their treatment. And then, of course, bed rest. We need to let them rest. And especially if we're talking about spinal shock and it's going to come back, we want to make sure there's no more irritation present. Long term, we're going to see that they may need physical occupational speech therapy. This would um, help the individual cope with whatever limitations they may have based on their injury. Uh, mobility with assistive devices, whether it's a wheelchair, a walker, um, different things like that. Long-term respiratory management, if, it, if it's going to be a high thoracic or cervical damage, they may need long-term respiratory management in the sense of being on a ventilator. Meticulous skin care, because again, they're putting pressure on areas they normally wouldn't. Bowel and bladder training or management to help them maybe be able to control that a little bit more. Um, we also see they may use anti-spastic um, um, agents like Botox or something like that to help treat muscle spasms. Of course, pain management, nutritional support, and a prompt treatments of infections. They are not going to have that mobility and, and issue to be able to maybe cough or, or um, sneeze as well and to get out any gunk that might get in their lungs. And so because of that, they need to be, um, we need to promptly treat any kind of infection that's th that might develop. <clears throat> All right, the next thing we're going to look at is Julian Barr syndrome. Um, this is an inflammatory demyelinating disease of the peripheral nervous system or a lower motor neuron disorder. So, guys, the key word here is it's the peripheral nervous system that's affected. It causes se segmental demyelination um, by T cells or B cells. And so, this is almost kind of like an autoimmune issue. Um, this is a complication of Zika virus infections. Um, a lot of times, the Zika virus does not really affect the individual. Um, too badly. It's kind of more of less um, flu-like symptoms. However, it can affect, um, it can get, have complications and this could be one of them. It's also known as an acute idiopathic polyneuropathy um, or what we call polyradical uh, neuropathy. And guys, neuropathy is where we lose feeling and things like that um, in a given area. And this is, in this case, it's due to demyelination of the neuron. Remember the myelin's, myelin's a special covering or insulation around each axon. Now the cause is unknown. A lot of times it is due to a post-infection um, immunologic mechanism like this whole idea of the body fighting off the Zika virus and then it continues to fight off the, on, fight the neurons. Um, spontaneous recovery usually does occur here. So once the body kind of um, slows down on the immune response and that sort of thing, then um, we see that there is some spontaneous recovery that can happen. As long as those swan cells are not damaged, they can remyelinate those neurons and function can return. So some clinical manifestations of Guillain-Barre syndrome is muscle weakness. This begins normally in the lower extremities, but it can spread to the proximal spinal nerves, okay, closer to the um, spinal cord. This can progress um, upwards and cause weakness or paralysis, and it can eventually affect the respiratory muscles, which could be a major complication and cause death if breathing has, is stopped. Uh, now, diagnosis is, of course, patient history, physical examination, um, nerve conduction studies. This is to make sure which nerves maybe are being affected because some nerves may be fine and others may start to be demyelinated. And so knowing which ones are working and which ones are not. And then, of course, a lumbar puncture to make sure we can rule out that there's not any meningitis, um, encephalitis, things like that, that could potentially be um, the trigger of this particular syndrome. Some treatment would be supportive. Um, we want to make sure that... Um, they're getting, again, the support, nutrition, things like that that they need. They also may use plasmapheresis, and this is where they would take the plasma. 
This is where they're going to take the plasma out and they'll run it through um, and then re-inject it in. And part of the reason of plasmapheresis is the plasma is going to have your white blood cells in it. And those white blood cells may be able to um, be altered or removed um, if they're the ones potentially causing the demyelinization. Um, they will also use a, the immunoglobulin. This will also help redirect the immune system so it stops attacking your nerve cells. Okay, and so this is Guillain-Barr syndrome. So now real quick, let's talk about Bell's palsy. Uh, Bell's palsy is an idiopathic neuropath um, neuropathy of the face, and it's specifically the facial nerve, and this is cranial nerve number seven. Um, this causes paralysis of the muscles of one side of the face. So normally what you see happening is the facial nerve on one side is being affected, which will cause droopiness in the face um, and not being able to control the muscles on that side. The etiology normally is a viral infection. However, it could also be due to an, a severe inner uh, severe middle ear infections can also potentially cause um, extra inflammation and, and, and infection and swelling around the um, facial nerve um, but normally it's due to some sort of infection viral or bacterial um, the clinical manifestations it develops rapidly over 24 to 48 hours um, you see unilateral facial weakness, so only one side of the face is affected. This causes facial droop, and it diminishes the, um, your ability to blink your eyes. All right, guys, sorry about that. Um, we see that it can cause facial droop and diminished eye blinking um, on that side that is affected by the Bell's palsy. We also see that they could have hyperacusis, which means that, that hearing and even just normal everyday sounds are, are heightened and are, are more uncomfortable for them. And also decreased lacrimation, so they don't produce as many tears in that eye. And then the lack of blinking is also going to cause the eye to dry out. Um, diagnosis, of course, is the physical findings. A lot of times you can look at the person's face and tell that it's probably Bell's palsy. Um, However, it can also kind of mimic what a stroke might kind of feel or look like. Uh, so an MRI, a CT, and an MEG would be used to, to, to rule out that there's anything else going on and that it is Bell's palsy. Um, treatment most of the time is going to be to um, clear up the underlining infection. Um, again, if it's viral, um, it will have to kind of clear up on its own. We can give some antivirals. If it's bacterial, like ear infections, it's to help um, speed that process up with antibiotics um, and then a lot of times if the as the nerve starts to try to fire and come back we need to work those muscles out and physical therapy is a potential treatment for that as well for them to exercise those muscles and get them to re-communicate with the um, neuron um, as long as the neuron is not completely damaged or severed due to the the infection this brings us to transient ischemic attacks, or what we call TIAs. Um, TIAs, guys, are a temporary episode of cerebral ischemia, and this results in symptoms of neurological deficits. So when we look at this, guys, this is like a precursor to a stroke, okay? This is almost like a warning sign, kind of like how chest pain and angina can be a warning sign of heart attack. This is kind of the same thing. Um, these are also known as mini strokes, as in little strokes, um, because their neurological deficits will mimic what a cerebral vascular accident or CVA, which is a stroke, um, would be, except that these deficits resolve within 24 hours. So they, they have that whole idea and the feeling of what a stroke would be like, but it does resolve. So within normally an hour or two or within the, the at least 24 hours, all their function does come back. Now these may occur singly, like one, and then you don't have one for a really long time or not ever again, or they could come in a series where you get one and then it kind of resolves and you get another one and so on. Now again, I said this is kind of like a warning sign and the whole point of this is it's to warn you of a potential impending CVA. Um, so because of this, we should take these very seriously and then look further to see if blood clots are present, if there is narrowing of the blood vessels and things like that. And so if you look here, this is kind of just showing you some different ways that strokes can potentially happen where you can end up getting a thrombosis where you can see that it's a blood clot. In other places, you can see that the they could get blocked off by... Um, the pathway being gunked up with that plaque, um, um, like you can see here, versus a normal carotid artery. And so it's really important to take this stuff seriously and to really look into what the um, underlying issue is that's causing these TIAs. 
So guys, if you recall, ischemia can occur because of the cerebral artery occlusion, meaning a thrombosis and embolus where a plaque is um, blocking the blood vessel. We also see that cerebral arteries could narrow. Um, this is that atherosclerosis, or this could also be due to spasms. Remember, the blood vessels can spasm and get smaller. Or we can see cerebral artery injuries due to inflammation or chronic hypertension, like high blood pressure. Um, additional risk factors could be migraines. Um, if, you trigger, if you suffer from migraines, it could put you at a higher risk for this. Smoking, diabetes, advancing age, um, in, inadequate nutrition, um, hypercholesteremia, of course, if you have high cholesterol and it's starting to build up, oral contraceptive usage, this is because it does increase your risk of potential blood clots, excessive alcohol consumption, and illicit drug use. Um, complications of a TIA could be permanent brain damage. If the area of the brain did not receive enough oxygen, even though it resolved itself, um, it could have killed some of that area that could potentially cause um, problems and deficits. Um, injury due to a fall, because um, let's just say that you're experiencing a TIA and it causes weakness on one side of your body and you fall, that could potentially cause a traumatic brain injury or something like that. And then and of course, a complication could be that this could advance into a CVA, an actual stroke. Um, so when we look at this, when we look at TIAs, they do begin suddenly and last normally only for a short period of time, because remember these are temporary, unlike a stroke. Manifestations are the same though as a stroke, but remember they just resolve. Um, they reflect the location of the ischemia, so this would be like if the, if the TIA happened on the right side of the brain, normally the left side of the body would be affected and vice versa. Um, we also see that you can have muscle weakness or even paralysis of the face, arm or leg. Um, usually it's only unilateral on one side of the body. You will see also maybe unilateral uh, parathesis, which is that tingling, pins and needles, aphasia or um, receptive aphasia, and this is where they have difficulty talking and speaking. Um, we also see that you could have dysphagia. We also see you can have dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing, uh, dysgraphia, which is difficulty writing. Um, we also see they might have difficulty reading, vision issues like um, double vision, nystagmus, which is the rapid movement of the eyeballs back and forth, or even complete or partial vision loss um, due to the stroke, the area that the, the TIA has taken place in. We also see changes in sensation like touch, pain, temperature, pressure, hearing, and taste. Again, it is going to reflect where it happens. So if the TIA happens in the somatosensory area of the parietal lobe, it's going to ultimately affect these things. Um, changes in your level of consciousness, personality, mood, or emotional changes if it happens in the frontal lobe, confusion, um, Ag um, agnosia, which is the inability to recognize or identify sensory stimuli, and so not being able to recognize the different sensations and what kind of information is coming in. Ataxia, which is the difficulty with the walking and abnormal gait. Vertigo or dizziness, because um, this is due to dizziness, which is vertigo with no stimuli. You didn't spin around on a, um, on a, um, you didn't spin around like on a ride or on a roller coaster and that caused you to be dizzy. You're just dizzy. Um, incontinence of the bowel or bladder can also um, be an issue with TIAs. So how do we diagnose these? Of course, we take a history, a physical examination. This includes a neurological assessment and, of course, blood pressure. Um, we want to make sure the blood pressure is not too high, but it's still getting blood to the brain. A head CT, head MRI. Um, we may do a carotid ultrasound, so checking out the carotids here because of those could be narrowed and weakened, which could potentially cause the ischemia. We also see that they could do a um, cerebral arteriogram, and this is a picture of the arteries within the brain to see and make sure, again, there's no blockages. Um, we could also do an electrocephalogram where we're going to look at the brain waves. Uh, serum clotting studies to make sure that you're not producing blood clots when you shouldn't. Um, again, we may do a complete blood count and blood chemistry. And again, looking at levels of different platelets, white blood cells, all the different stuff. They'll also look at erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Um, again, this is looking at the red blood cells and how many you have, um, making sure that the blood's not too thick. And of course, serum lipid levels, making sure your cholesterol and your lipids are not too high. And so blood work is a major part of this to check out a lot of different factors that could be responsible for the TIA. Now, how do we treat a TIA? 
Um, we need to manage the underlying condition. So again, if it's due to flat, fat plaques, we need to um, address that with the high cholesterol. If it's um, chronic high blood pressure, we need to address the blood pressure. Um, but the whole point is to find what the underlying cause is. We also need to look at maybe antiplatelet aggregation agents. If it's due to blood clots, anticoagulants, they may need an angioplasty where you have to go in and open up the blood vessels. Um, if the carotid is starting to have issues, we may need to do a carotid endopterectomy where they have to go in and open that up and, and widen the, the um, carotid. Um, stop smoking. Smoking, stopping smoking since that's a risk factor. Minimizes dietary cholesterol and fat. Increasing dietary fruits and vegetables. Exercising regularly. Limiting alcohol consumption and, elic and eliminating illicit drug use. And so some of these things we can take care of on our own, but we have to be vigilant with that in order to help um, decrease our risk for another TIA and a potential stroke. Um, other things, the damage might already be starting to be done in some medical treatments um, like the carotids or the angioplasty may need to be done. All right, so this brings us to the cerebral vascular accident, which is also known as stroke or what we call brain attack. Just like a heart attack is, is called a myocardial infarction, um, this one would be a brain attack called a cerebral vascular accident. Now, what causes a CVA? It's an interruption of the cerebral blood supply. So it causes ischemic damage, and this ischemic damage, however, is permanent. It's not like the TIA where it is going to be temporary. This is permanent damage. And some causes could be total vessel occlusion, meaning that's totally blocked off, and this could be due to a thrombosis, an embolus, or again, a plaque. Um, we could see cerebral vascular rupture. So this is if a cerebral aneurysm that um, where the blood vessel gets weakened and it and it bulges out and it gets weaker and weaker as more blood fills in and it busts like a balloon. Um, we also see there could be um, atriovenous malformation, so those capillaries where the, ve the veins and the arteries are supposed to come together to allow for the blood exchange to continue out of the brain, that could be malformed where it's not um, uh, draining blood out of there properly, and also hypertension, chronic hypertension blood pressure. Now major types of CVAs, ischemic strokes are the most common. So again, ischemia means that it's a lack of oxygen and nutrients to the area. However, there's also hemorrhagic strokes. Hemorrhagic strokes are due to the bleeding. So it's where the blood vessel ruptures and you're bleeding out to the brain. So not only is that tissue not getting blood supply and getting um, a nutrients to the area, but it's also creating um, intracranial pressure. And so this, can, this one is the most fatal type of CVA. All right, so if we look here, here's the difference between the two. Over here, you can see the ischemic stroke. There's a blood clot um, right here that is blocking this area. So the area that's in the purple is having the lack of oxygen, uh, the lack of nutrients, and so we see that brain tissue starts to die. On the other hand, over here on this side, you can see that this is a hemorrhagic stroke, and so the blood vessel has broken and ruptured. So not only are the areas of the brain around here that are turning kind of bluish purple are not getting nutrients or supplies of oxygen and um, nutrients, they're also um, seeing the pressure of the blood build up in the brain, um, which is causing um, intracranial pressure to increase. So some complications of a CVA are neurological deficits and then ultimately death. Um, CVAs are most common in African Americans and those living in the southeast region of the United States. Um, now, one link to this um, is a lot to do with the food that we eat. Okay, so down in the south, they tend to eat more food that is um, fried, that um, has real butter in it, and so things like that. So their their cholesterol intake is a lot higher, which potentially leads to more complications. And so that's what we're seeing here with that link of the south and potentially the African Americans who live in the south um, and it's mostly based on diet that we're looking at there. Um, additional risk factors though are physical inactivity, not being physically active, obesity, hypertension, of course, chronic high blood pressure, smoking, the hypercholesteremia, diabetes, um, arthrosclerosis, again, we see buildup of plaque in the vet vessels, oral contraceptive usage, excessive alcohol consumption, and illicit drug use. So if you'll notice, these risk factors are the exact same risk factors that we saw in the TIA. So manifestations, though, guys, are similar to those in the TIA, um, so I'm not going to really go over each one of them again, except that the CVA symptoms do not resolve. They do not um, get better over time, okay? They're permanent, and the TIAs were 
temporary. Uh, manifestations may improve with, improve with time with therapy, but they can remain creating potential complications. So we see that the damage in the brain is already done. We can't get it back, but your brain may be able to reroute around the damage. And that rerouting does take a lot of time and it's going to take training of the brain to do this. And so because of that, it may um, only, you may only see a little bit of the deficits start to come back over time. Um, additional manifestations could be headaches. These may be present with especially hemorrhagic strokes because of the increased intracranial pressure. So again, how do we diagnose cerebral vascular accidents? Of course, we can see that the history is important, a physical exam, again, looking at the neurological assessment. We do a head CT, head MRI. They do a carotid ultrasound to make sure, again, the carotids are open and sending blood up to the brain. A cerebral arteriogram, again, getting a picture of the blood vessels of the brain. Serum clotting studies, blood chemistry, and a complete blood count. So again, the blood's gonna give us maybe a good indication of what the underlying problem might be of the CBA. All right, so what about treatment? Treatment requires prompt treatment, okay, to minimize the brain damage. We need to get the person to the hospital and get them treatment as soon as possible. Uh, determining whether a CVA is ischemic or hemorrhagic in origin prior to treatment is super important, okay, because depending, you're going to have to treat it differently. If it's a blood clot, of course, we want to dissolve that clot and we want to get rid of that. And so you would have to give blood thinners and things like that and anticoagulants. On the other hand, if it's due to a bleed, you don't want to give them those things because then it would continue to make the bleed worse. So it's really important to know which kind of stroke the individual is having. Um, treatment should be delivered within three hours of the symptom onset. So as soon as we start to see those symptoms within three hours, they should be receiving some sort of treatment okay, for this stroke. So with the ischemic, ischemic strokes, we want to see that we're going to use thrombolytic agents, the whole idea of breaking up that thrombus or blood clot, um, aspirin, an angioplasty may need to be done where we take, it's almost like an angioplasty in the heart where we take the balloon, open it up and, and kind of um, get the blood flow to return to the area. And again, if the carotid is the issue, we need to go in and we need to clear that out. Okay, going in and getting rid of the debris and stuff like that, that's blocking the potential carotid. In hemorrhagic strokes though, of course the treatment's going to be different. This would be surgical repair of the aneurysm. We also see that we may look at the arterial venous malformation to see if we can um, correct some of that so that we can stop the bleeding and then return blood flow to those potential areas to prevent further damage of the brain tissue. Corticosteroids and antihypertensive type of drugs may be administered with either type. Um, again, that decreases inflammation and it also reduces the blood pressure. Multidisciplinary team management might be needed because we may be able to treat the problem, but the damage is already done. And remember this damage can be permanent and so because of that we may need to bring in a lot of different um, um, individuals to help this person be able to um, regain some of their, their loss and also have a, 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 the best life that they can possible after the stroke. Um, again though we do want to look at strategies to prevent complications of immobility. Um, if we have immobility then that of course opens up other doors to like skin breakdown and things like that that potentially could cause more issues for the patient. Okay so it's really important with this treatment to of course treat the underlying cause of the CVA and then it's going to be treatment to help get the person back to the most normal normal life if possible. All right, so this brings us to cerebral aneurysms because these aneurysms could potentially cause a CVA. We want to look at them. Um, an aneurysm is a localized outpooching of the cerebral arteries due to weakening of the arterial wall. Okay, so the wall should be straight. And so what happens here is this side looks straight and then this side starts to curve out. And then blood starts collecting in it, getting worse and worse, stretching it kind of like when you overfill a balloon and it will eventually pop. Now this could be a congenital issue where th that area of those blood vessels are just weaker and as the person gets older, it just weakens more and more and it's kind of like a ticking time bomb that's happening in them. However, high blood pressure can also contribute to these. Um, if the individual has a connective tissue disease like Marfan syndrome, um, we see that that already causes weakness within the blood vessels. And a lot of times you don't see cerebral aneurysms with that. You see more of an aortic aneurysm around the heart, which is very life-threatening because if the aorta ruptures and dissects and opens up, then blood flow to the whole body is Hindered, um, not just to the brain. We also see traumatic brain injuries could increase the chance of an aneurysm and then arterial wall infections. So if an infection is affecting the arterial wall, it can weaken that area of the artery. 
Um, with this, because of the weakening of the artery, it can put pressure on the surrounding tissue as well as leak or even rupture, like break open, and this causes again a CVA and potentially death. Um, most are what we call berry or saccular, so it makes little kind of sacs in there um, where there's maybe more than necessarily one out pooching. We see that most frequently occur in multiples on the circle of Willis. Now, again, this is for cerebral aneurysms, and so there is so there is an area where blood flow in the brain comes up and it creates a circle on the kind of the underside of the brain to make sure that all the brain is receiving um, blood. And so this area, the circle of Willis, is an area where we see that a lot of aneurysms could potentially develop. So many of the aneurysms are pretty much asymptomatic until they grow large enough to start compressing surrounding areas. When they start compressing those particular areas, then you start to see symptoms depending on what area is affected. Um, and then if it ruptures, of course, we would see effects of that. Uh, manifestations, you see there may have vision issues like double vision or vision loss. Um, headaches are very common, eye pain, and even neck pain. If the patient has a very sudden severe headache, it could be an indication that the aneurysm has ruptured. Um, this may resemble those um, manifestations or signs that we see in intracranial pressure and even CVAs because that's technically what's happening. Okay, and so if we look here at this, um, this particular film over here, it shows you there where the aneurysm is. You can see it right here where there's that outpooching of the blood and it's a pocket that should not be there. In this case, it's actually a pretty large vessel. So again, how do we diagnose this? We take a history, a physical exam. You're going to do a cerebral arteriography, which is what you just saw on the last slide, a head CT, a head MRI, and then, of course, an electroencephalogram to look at the brain activity in that area because, again, the brain, could, brain tissue could be disrupted due to the pressure of the aneurysm. So what are some treatments? Um, one of the most common treatments is surgical repair. If it's able to be accessed, we want to surgically repair it. And a lot of times this is due to placing clips. They'll put clips around it and so that prevents it from rupturing or blowing and then rerouting the blood vessel around that area. Um, managing contributing factors if it's due to high blood pressure, things like that, or strategies similar to those with CVA and even subarachnoid hemorrhaging because um, again, we want to prevent the bleeding from taking place. All right, so now we're gonna switch gears again and we're gonna talk a little bit about seizures. So guys, what is a seizure? A seizure is a transient physical or behavioral alteration that results from an abnormal electrical activity in the brain. So what happens here is the brain kind of almost short circuits and it kind of goes haywire. It gets overly excited, which causes it to kind of almost like freeze. Kind of like when you open too many things on your computer and it's having to try to do too much work and it freezes up. This is technically kind of what happens in a seizure. The brain is misfiring, which means the other parts of the brain cannot um, control what's going on in the body. And so all the neurons are kind of firing all at once. So what are some causes of seizures? There could be altered membrane ion channels. Remember that those action potentials are going to use those ion channels. If those are disrupted, of course, it could have, it could cause them to misfire. We could also see altered extracellular electrolytes. Imbalances within the cerebral spinal fluid around the cells could potentially cause them to misfire. Imbalanced excitatory or inhibitory neurotransmitters where you may not have enough inhibitory ones that don't shut down the neurons or you have too many excitatory um, neurotransmitters present and so these could ultimately affect how the neurons are going to fire and how often. Now these can occur secondary though to a trauma and we saw that um, in some tra some of the traumas like on um, traumatic brain injuries we saw that seizures could have been a byproduct. We also see hypoglycemia like where the blood sugar gets too low it can actually cause potential seizures. Electrolyte disorders where your electrolytes get out of whack. Um, acidosis where your blood and your cerebral spinal fluid becomes too acidic which is not a good environment for your neurons certain infections, tumors, or even chemical ingestion, like certain medications, um, certain illegal drugs, or even alcohol could potentially cause an individual to have seizures. Um, some of our seizure disorders, one is called epilepsy. Epilepsy is where seizure, it's a seizure disorder resulting from spontaneous firing of abnormal neurons. It is characterized by reoccurrent seizures for which there's no underlining or correctable cause. And so what happens is this person just has seizures. They don't really know why it's happening. They don't really know um, what's kind of triggering it a lot of times. It could be um, bright lights, it could be flashing lights, it could be loud sounds, um, but something is triggering them to potentially have these seizures. And these are abnormal neurons that are just firing spontaneously when they shouldn't. 
So what are some complications of things like epilepsy or even just seizures in general? We can see brain damage. And guys, the brain damage is due to the lack of oxygen normally to the brain, okay? Because ultimately everything's misfiring, which could cause the individual to not breathe properly while a seizure is going on. The longer the seizure lasts, the more compromised their breathing might be. Also, brain damage could be due to them falling. And when they have a seizure, they may fall and this could cause dramatic brain injuries. We also see that they could, um, they could do aspiration where they have a foaming or an extra amount of saliva that's being um, formed in their mouth and they're not um, breathing correctly, which causes them to, instead of swallowing that saliva, it, they aspirate it down into their lungs. Um, it could cause mood disorders. We also see that they could have what we call st a status, status epileptic. This is seizures that last longer than 20 minutes or even subsequent seizures that occur before the next one's fully over. Okay, so they, the one, so they occur before the individuals fully regain consciousness. So they have this massive seizure, they haven't fully come to, and they have another seizure. And then they it stops, and they're about to come to, and they have another seizure, okay? So we can see one that lasts for a really long time, or one just right after another, okay? And these are the ones that are really dangerous because it's altering how they're breathing and their normal vital functions, like their heart rate and things like that. So when we look at seizures, there's two broad categories to look at in seizures. There's what we consider a focal seizure and a generalized seizure. Not all can be easily defined by these terms though. Sometimes you may, they may think it's more of a focal, but it could be generalized. It's not like a cut and dry black and white type thing. Um, some seizures begin as focal seizures, but then they spread into the entire brain and become uh, generalized seizures. Um, other people may have both types of seizures with no clear pattern. There's not like um, times where they have focal versus when they have generalized. They just have seizures that affect the two different areas. So guys, when we look at focal seizures, focal seizures are going to happen in one particular part of the brain. So they normally affect only kind of one thing. A generalized seizure is going to affect the whole brain, which means it's going to affect the whole body. So let's look at the focal seizures first. Uh, focal seizures, because they're only happening in part of the brain, they're also called partial seizures. These occur in just one part of the brain. They vary depending on the area of the brain that's affected. So depending on if it's like the frontal lobe versus the occipital lobe, it's going to affect different parts of the individual. Um, so we have some different types. There's what we call simple focal seizures. This is where the individual remains conscious, um, but experiences unusual feelings of sensations that can, make, can take many forms. So they have, may have something like a sudden and unexplained feelings of joy. There's no really reason that they have this, but they have this flooding of joyful emotion. It could be anger. It could be sadness. They could have nausea. It just hits them and it just floods their body with this whole idea of nausea. They may hear, smell, or taste, or even see things that are not really real. They just, it's a sensation that just gets triggered for some reason. And it has not been triggered by a real manifestation of a smell or sound or anything like that. Okay, so these would be considered focal seizures. And again, it depends on what part of the brain is being affected. We then see that this could progress to what we call complex focal seizures. This is where the individual has changes in or loss of consciousness. So they might kind of come in and out or they may lose consciousness altogether. Um, this produces kind of almost like a dreamlike experience for the person. Um, they may display strange re repetitious behaviors like where they'll blink continuously over and over, a twitching that might take place. They may move the, their mouth like they're talking but they're really not, um, walking in circles. Um, these types of things that are repetitive type of behaviors that are seen with these type of seizures are called what we call automasticism. So automasticism is where we see that it's re re repetitious behavior, like the blinking, the moving of the mouth like they're talking, walking in circles, but this is due to a complex focal seizure. So it's affecting, it's affecting an area that has complex control, not just control of necessarily one type of area. And like I said, it's more of a dreamlike state for the individual. They re maybe remember parts of it, but not all of it. Now, focal seizures, guys, usually last just for a few seconds. They don't last for very long. Um, some people may experience what we call um, auroras. This is usually sensations just prior to the seizure. This happens sometimes also with like migraines. They have an idea that the migraine is about to hit, and the same thing can happen here. It's like they know that the seizure is about to come. Um, these are actually going to be simple focal seizures in which the person maintains consciousness, and then a bigger one may come along after it. 
Now, seizure characteristics tend to be similar with every seizure. They can easily be confused with other types of disorders like migraine headaches, narcolepsy, syncope, which is fainting, or even some psychiatric disorders because they have that dreamlike state or they're seeing things that aren't really there, or hearing things that aren't really there, which can be a trigger or could be a sign of potentially schizophrenia. But these are due to a seizure, not due to um, another issue like with schizophrenia. So again, here's just some examples of if a focal seizure happens in certain parts of the brain. So in the frontal lobe, you can see what we call a, a Jacksonian type seizure. This is tingling feelings in the hands or arms. Um, ad, adversive seizures or eyes or head uh, both turn to one side of the body. Uh, temporal lobe, you can see a strange smell or taste, altered behavior, feelings as if they've been there before, like deja vu, um, lip smacking or chewing movements. In the parietal lobe, they may have tingling and or jerking in, of the one arm or a leg or then their face. The occipital lobe, they might, flashing lights or spots may come into play or they may even have vomiting that takes place. But these are just some ideas of some focal seizures that could potentially take place in an individual. Now, generalized seizures is what we normally would talk about as seizures. Um, this is an abnormal neuro neurological activity on both sides of the brain. Um, they may cause a loss of consciousness, um, falls, or even massive muscle spasms while the seizure is going on. Um, there's some different types though. The first one is called an absent seizure. This is previously called a peat mall seizure. Okay, so you may have heard of it as a peat mall seizure, which means small seizure, but it's really an absent seizure. That's the new name. This is where the individual may appear to be staring into space um, and or having like jerking or twitching muscles. And so a lot of times kids will have these and it's like they're just daydreaming. They're not there. And you want to go up there and be like, hey, wake up. But they're really not there. It's absent. The brain is over firing. And so they're really not conscious of what's going on. Okay, and so this is what we would call an absence seizure. Now, there is kind of a picture that kind of illustrates an absence seizure in your book on page 363. The next one is what we call tonic seizures. Um, tonic seizures cause stiffening of the muscles of the body. Uh, generally, those are the black back and the extremities, so it causes the individual to be very stiff. <clears throat> the next one is called clonic seizures. This causes repeating jerking movements of muscles on both sides of the body. So this is where they're actually like jerking uh, back and forth. Um, so this is what we would call a clonic seizure. All right, so we've already talked a little bit about the clonic seizure. Um, there's another one that's called a myoclonic seizure. This causes jerks or twitches of the upper body, arms, or legs. Okay, myoclonic. We also see atonic seizure. This causes a loss of normal muscle tone. So the person will fall down and they may drop his or her head involuntarily. So their head may just like fall and then they will fall. A lot of times you can kind of think of this as like those fainting goats where they just kind of like fall over for no real reason. Um, that's kind of what happens here, like fainting. Um, we can also take these a step further where we add some of these words together. Um, one is called the tonic clonic seizures. This one was previously called the grand mal seizure. And this is kind of like the mother of all seizures, the biggest seizures that you can have. It causes stiffening of the body first. So the body goes into that tonic um, phase where it stiffens and they normally would fall. And then they go into the clonic part, which is the repetitive jerking of the arms and legs. They do lose consciousness when they have the tonic clonic seizures. Now, with the tonic-clonic seizures as well, um, a lot of times they also lose control of their bowels, and so you'll see that they'll have urination or even defecation that happens because they lose control of all of that. We then see after a seizure takes place, there is a period that's called the uh, post period. Um, this is just after a seizure. The individual may be confused of what happened. They'll be fatigued or tired because a lot of times in that tonic-clonic seizure, their muscles are so stiffened and then jerking that it's almost like they've done a huge workout okay, in that, in that short period of time. And so they'll be fatigued or tired and they may fall into a pretty deep sleep. Okay, so this is af the aftermath of the potential seizure. So how do we diagnose seizure disorders? Of course, we're gonna take a history. This includes a description of the seizure activity if possible, um, if they've been able to kind of document it and that sort of thing. Physical examination, a head CT, a head MRI, they also may do a head PET scan. Um, they also may do an electroencephalogram where they're going to look at the electrical activity. And sometimes, guys, when they do this electroencephalogram, that's also where they're going to put different things in front of them to see if they can cause them to have a seizure to see if there's a trigger, like if it's bright lights, if it's... Um, 
going to be bright colors or flashing lights or sounds that may trigger a potential seizure. So they can also see the activity of the brain when the seizure is happening. So what are some treatments for seizure disorders? Well, during a seizure, the big thing is positioning the individual on his side, his or her, her side. And the reason for this, guys, is a lot of times we want to prevent that aspiration. They may have that foaming of the mouth or producing an extra saliva, and we don't want it to go down into their lungs, okay, because they're already probably struggling to breathe a little bit. So if you roll them on their side, it allows it to um, leave out that way. Um, we also see we want to protect their head. Um, we don't want a traumatic brain injury to come from this because they fall and hit their head. So we want to we want to try to protect their head if all possible. Uh, do not force items in between the individual's teeth. I used to think, people used to think, oh my gosh, they're going to bite off their tongue, they're going to swallow, or we're going to have an issue. The big thing though is if you start putting stuff into their mouth and trying to go in between their teeth, um, you could lose fingers if you try to do your hand. You could actually make it worse where you break their teeth and cause them to choke in another way. And so for the most part, you just need to not, don't put anything in their mouth. Um, also, do not restrain the individual. You need to let their body do what it's going to do. All right. So you want to kind of hold and support the head, but you need to let the, their body go ahead and do what it's going to do. Because if you try to restrain strain them, you could potentially injure them more. Um, you want to manage their airway though, making sure that their airway does stay open. So as soon as the seizure is um, over, you want to make sure that breathing is still taking place. Um, oxygen therapy, giving them oxygen might slow down or even um, cause the, the seizure not to last as long. Muscle relaxants, anti-seizure agents, of course, may need to be administered to help make sure that they don't continue to have one seizure after another, and also allow them to sleep, allow their body to rest after they've had that seizure. Um, some other kind of precautions, if the, if the patient is known to have seizures, you don't need to leave their bed rails down because you're not going to always be in there when they have seizures, so you need to make sure their bed rails are up. You may also want to make sure that there's a suction device that is hooked up and ready to go to also help suction after they've had their seizure. So you put it on their side and then you suction up any of that liquid to also help prevent aspiration. Now for epilepsy, we see that they've been diagnosed with epilepsy. We want to also give them anti-seizure agents to hopefully stop them from having those seizures. Um, surgical resection or transection of a certain area may need to be done um, to help decrease the amount of seizures that they're having. They may need to wear their, a medical alert bracelet. This is to make sure that it lets other people know that they potentially have this problem. And then of course, avoid factors that might trigger a seizure, um, not getting enough sleep, alcohol, drugs, um, excessive stimuli like the bright lights, going to a concert that could overstimulate you could potentially cause a seizure. So again, if you know that there's a potential cause that triggers the, your epilepsy, you, then you need to try to stay away from it. All right, so now we're going to talk about multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is a debilitating autoimmune condition. This involves a progressive and irreversible demyelination of the brain. So when we saw earlier, when we looked at Guillain-Barre syndrome, this was a demyelination of the peripheral neurons, but it was um, fixable. Here it's not, okay? And so this is going to happen in the brain, spinal cord, or cranial nerve. So you're looking more at the central nervous system here for multiple sclerosis. So damage occurs in diffuse patches throughout the nervous system, and it slows or stops nerve impulses. Guys, nerves have to be able to communicate with other nerves. And so if the demyelination takes place where it doesn't have that, that um, insulation around the axon, it's going to misfire and not be able to communicate with the next neuron. Um, this progresses causes the damage um, to then be irreversible because the neuron will die. Um, so progression of the damage does vary. It can happen quickly. It can happen slowly. And so that's one thing we're looking at with multiple sclerosis. Now, multiple sclerosis is most common in women, um, in Caucasians, and those living in temperate climates a lot. Um, the onset of symptoms usually occur between the ages of 20 to 40 years of age. Um, some complications with multiple sclerosis, of course, epilepsy, so it's misfiring again because now we have abnormal neurons and they're misfiring due to not having the insulation around them. We also see paralysis. This is going to most often be seen in the legs. And then depression, okay, because a lot of times when an individual has MS, they know that it's debilitating and it's not, and it's a progressive disorder. It's not something that can be cured or reversed. And so because of that, it can be a very de depressing diagnosis. So guys, when we look at multiple sclerosis, it varies depending on the degree of damage um, of the neurons. And so if you look here, guys, this is showing you the myelination and you can see how it's being demyelinated. It's breaking apart. And when that breaks apart, you'll also see that the axon of the neuron gets disrupted here in the bottom picture. Now, 
Multiple sclerosis is characterized by remissions and exacerbations where the individual does feel better at times, but then it, the disease is exacerbated and they get worse. These exacerbations could last for only a couple of days, but they could last for months. Uh, fever, hot baths, sun exposure, and stress can all trigger or worsen these episodes. So it can make the episode last longer or it can trigger an actual exacerbation. Um, they may progress without without remissions. This is going to be in the more aggressive types of MS and where they do not have those remissions in between the exacerbation. It just can, can, it just progressively gets worse and worse and with no relief. So what are some manifestations of multiple sclerosis? Well, of course, the patient really feels fatigued. They have loss of balance because those, those neurons are not firing properly, and so they're not letting the muscles know what they're doing. Um, it does cause muscle spasms because this is an upper motor neuron problem. Okay, Upper motor neurons, remember, cause the muscles to have that spastic type of paralysis. We also see parathesis or abnormal sensations in areas, uh, problems moving their arms and legs, weakness in one or both arms or legs, they could have unsteady gait, so if they're not feeling their arms and legs and they're not, um, uh, and they're having weakness there, of course, it can cause an unsteady gait. Uh, lack of coordination, uh, tremors in one or more of the arms or legs, constipation or and stool leakage, so it can cause them to be constipated. On the other hand, it could cause them not to be able to um, control that area as well. Uh, urinary frequency, urgency, hesitancy, or even incontinence, so again, it's going to affect the urinary system. Vision issues, like double vision or even vision loss. So this would be if the optic nerve, too, is being affected by the demyelination. We also see decreased attention span, poor judgment and memory loss if the frontal lobe is affected, difficulty reasoning and problem solving, dizziness, hearing loss if it's the vestibular cochlear nerve as well as the dizziness, which is cranial nerve 8, sexual dysfunction, slurred, slurred speech, and dysphagia, difficulty swallowing. So if you notice multiple sclerosis, this is kind of like their diagnosis. When they get that diagnosis, this is showing them what's going to potentially happen. It starts out with them being tired and weak, and it can progress. So how do they diagnose MS? Um, a history, a physical exam, this does include neurological assessment, an MRI study, and this is going to be more specifically for the brain and spinal cord. We also see that there'll be a lumbar puncture. This is with the cerebral spinal fluid to analyze it. This often is going to help us show if there are certain levels of proteins or gamma glob globulins or lymphocytes that are present that are potentially causing the demyelinization. What happens here is the immune system starts to attack the oligodendrocytes of the central nervous system who do the myelination for the, the neurons. If the oligodendrocytes die, we cannot return the, the myelination back to the neuron and then the neuron ultimately dies. And then of course, I do a nerve conduction study and this again is to make sure that and this, the nerve conduction study is to make sure that the um, that it's an upper motor neuron issue and not a lower motor neuron issue because we'll see later that some of the demyelination in the lower motor neurons is a different disease. Um, so treatment, there's no cure. So once the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis is given, um, there's really no cure to get rid of it, okay? And so we're just trying to treat the patient and slow down the progression. Um, so we may use corticosteroids. These are going to help um, treat the exacerbations, so hopefully make them sh uh, shorter if at all possible. Interferons will help slow the damage. Um, immunomodulators will help suppress the immune system, so they may hopefully maybe stop attacking the oligodendrocytes. Uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, helping them learn how to use assistive devices like wheelchairs, walkers, or handrails, especially when they have exacerbations. Um, coping strategies. What are some things that they can do that help them cope with um, this? And this is going to help hopefully decrease the individual's depression, um, giving them support, proper nutrition, and of course, adequate, adequate rest. All right, so our next one we want to look at is Parkinson's disease. With Parkinson's disease, this is a progressive condition involving the destruction of an area in the brain called the stra uh, substantia nigra in the brain. This particular area is a set of ganglia of cell bodies in the brain who help coordinate uh, body movements and suppress unwanted movements. And they do this by releasing dopamine. So what happens in this area, because they're being destroyed, it results in a lack of dopamine, which ultimately affects this. Um, when approximately 80% of the dopamine producing cells are destroyed, movement issues are typically um, seen, which include tremors. Those are those involuntary shakes that we saw. 
of the hands and like a lot of times the head but it can also be the feet as well the tremors may disappear or decrease when the body part is moved intentionally so when the individual intentionally moves their arm to grab something those tremors stop but once they're done doing that that intentional movement the tremor comes back now the cause for parkinson's is unknown we don't know what causes it um, for unknown reasons more this is more common in men and those living in more rural areas um, again we're not really sure because we don't know what causes it so we can't say like oh well if you live in rural areas this is the reason why we just see that it is more prominent in rural areas and in men so what are some manifestations for parkinson's first we see slowing or stopping of the automatic movements like blinking um, we also see that the person has constipation uh, dysphagia drooling unsteady gait um, they may also have what we call a mask like appearance of the face and guys this just means that it looks like they're wearing a mask they don't have a lot of facial expressions and a lot of this is due to the loss of function and movement of those muscles of the face we also see myalgia and this is muscle pain so they just their muscles just feel kind of painful um, they also have problems with movement this is difficulty initiating or continuing movement so like walking or getting out of a chair so with the walking they may get the movement down and they're going but once it's a step or a curb it throws them off and it's it causes them to have ataxia on the other hand getting out of a chair it causes them to have to go back and forth back and forth till they finally get enough momentum in a sense that's what we normally would think of it as but it's just really the coordination of the right muscles in order to help stand them up we also see that they can have loss of fine um, hand movements so writing becomes difficult um, their handwriting will get very small it can't it can't be read eating could also become difficult because holding utensils causes is used by fine motor movement we also see that they may have a shuffling gait where you see that it's more of a shuffle instead of steps they're just shuffling forward and also we see that their movements become slow Slowed, and this is called bradykinesia um, because everything is slowing down in this process with Parkinson's with coordination and the some more manifestations we already talked about are the tremors is usually occur in the limbs at rest if they are um, being used for something we obviously see that it normally stops eventually it can be seen in the head lips tongue and even the feet it may be worse when they're tired excited or stressed um, they have uh, what we call finger thumb rolling or what we call pill rolling tremors and so when we look at this it has to do with their finger and thumbs kind of rolling in a sense of like a tremor like this with their hands we see that they have rigid or stiff muscles this also often begins in their legs uh, slow or quieter speech with more of a monotone type voice there's no inflection in their voice they may have a stooped posture where they're kind of leaning down um, anxiety stress and even tension confusion dementia uh, depression we also see syncope of with fainting hallucinations memory loss and sybaria which is a rash it's normally an itchy type rash that um, is red with kind of more white scales with it and so these are just some manifestations of Parkinson's disease all right, in your textbook on page 366, this one kind of puts some of those manifestations into a picture. It shows you the short shuffling steps, the tremors, the hip and knees are slightly flexed, their arms are flexed, the elbows, it causes rigidity in the back, stooped posture, mask-like face, and tremors. So these are things you're definitely going to be able to see. Diagnosis for Parkinson's, of course, history, physical exam, um, again, because this is a neurological issue, we want to do an assessment there, and really what they're going to do is they're going to do other tests to rule out other conditions. Uh, if we can rule out those other conditions, more than likely then it's Parkinson's disease. Again, there's no cure for Parkinson's. There are different medications like uh, levodopa or dopamine agonists, and the whole point here is to increase the amount of dopamine that, that needs to be released. Um, this will help slow down the progression um, there are hard cases there have been cases where medication doesn't help and they need deep brain stimulation this is to stimulate those cells that still are present um, to produce more dopamine uh, physical or occupational therapy along with how to use assistive devices um, again this is no cure for this disease so coping strategies and support are super important for these patients um, and their families proper nutrition adequate rest this can all help promote an overall health and because a lot of times the tremors and stuff will get worse if they're stressed and not um, feeling as well and so if we can keep them over um, overall in a healthy state this might help um, slow down the progression of their Parkinson's 
All right, the next one we wanna look at is what we call um, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, or also known as ALS. Um, this is also called Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, ALS has made kind of a big comeback into um, the public into public eye um, with that ice bucket challenge that went through um, and this brought ALS into the forefront so people kind of were talking about it and at least kind of maybe knowing a little bit more about it. What happens in ALS though is there's a damage of the upper motor neurons like we see in MS, multiple sclerosis, but there's also damage to lower motor neurons of the brain stem and spinal cord. And so we see here that this is kind of the difference. In MS, you see more of an issue in the upper motor neurons. In ALS, you see an issue in both. It's a breakdown of both types of neurons. Um, so if we're looking at upper motor neuron damage in ALS, you see weakness, lack of motor control. Um, this causes a loss of control of spinal reflexes, stiffness, and spasticity. If it's a lower motor neuron damage, you see that the individual has irritation. Um, we'll see that they have what we call those uh, fasciculations in the muscles. Uh, decreased neuron firing, which causes weakness, denervation, atrophy, and hyporeflexia if it's the lower motor neurons. And guys, like I said with ALS, it is a combination of both. And so what happens here in ALS, you see the sensory neurons, cognitive function, and cranial. Cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6 are not affected. So what happens here is the individual can still feel everything. They do not have an issue with the sensory portion, okay? Their cognitive function is fine. They are normal when it comes to their brain in the sense of having cognitive function. This is an effect mostly motor issues. Again, though, there, it does not affect cranial nerve three, five, and six, which all help with eye movement. Okay, so eye movement is totally unaffected with this as well. Now, the nerves lose their ability to trigger muscle movement. This results in muscle weakness, um, that causes them to have the disability of paralysis and eventually death. And guys, for the most part, this usually is within five years of the onset of their symptoms. Once they get the start to have symptoms of ALS, normally their lifespan is only five more years after that. There are some very rare cases where the person gets diagnosed and they live for a long time because it's slowly progressive. One example of this is um, Stephen Hawking. Um, Stephen Hawking is in a wheelchair though. He can't really move anything. Um, however, his eyes are not affected and that's why they developed that computer that he can use his eyes to communicate. And um, that they use him a lot of times on the Big Bang Theory and things like that because he's still super smart. His cognitive function is not impaired at all. His eyes are not impaired at all, at all but he cannot move any of his other muscles. Okay, and this is a very severe case of ALS that has a slow progression to it. Most of the time, again, it have once symptoms start, you only have about five years. Now, with ALS, guys, the cause is really unknown, but we do know that genetics plays a role. Okay, so we knew, do know that if a parent has has had ALS, there is a good chance that it could have been passed on to the kids. Um, some possible causes of ALS could be free radical damage. Um, inherited ALS often involves a mutation in a certain gene um, that produces a strong antioxidant enzyme that protects cells from a free radical damage, so this could be part of it. We see excessive glutamate. Um, people with ALS often have higher glutamate, which is a chemical messenger in the brain. Um, we see this as higher levels in the cerebral spinal fluid and excessive glutamate is toxic to some nerve cells. Um, or it could maybe be an autoimmune response where the immune system starts to go haywire and cause issues kind of like with MS. Again, we're not real sure, but the more money that is given to ALS research, the more research can be done to potentially find the cause. So what are the manifestations of ALS? Uh, manifestations become progressively worse as more motor neurons, of course, are damaged. The upper, uh, the loss of upper motor neurons results in spastic paralysis and hyperreflexia. The loss of lower motor neurons results in flaccid paralysis. Um, early manifestations may cause foot drop, where the foot drops and it drags, and so this potentially could cause the individual to have falls. Lower extremity weakness, hand weakness. Um, it causes their hands to become weaker and they can't hold on to things as well. They may not be able to feed themselves as well and things like that. Um, clumsiness, slurred speech, dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, um, muscle cramps and twitching in the upper extremities and the tongue. 
Um, when we look at ALS, frequently it begins in the upper or lower extremities and then spreads to other parts of the body. Um, as the disease advances, the muscles become progressively weaker until they become paralyzed. So they just get weaker and weaker and weaker until they are not functional. It will eventually affect chewing, swallowing, speaking, and then breathing. And this is why it pro when it progresses pretty quickly, we see that breathing is affected, which then means that it makes them um, more prone to potentially upper respiratory, or it potentially makes them more prone to respiratory infections, things like that, which does decrease their lifespan. Um, diagnosis, history, physical exam. This again occur, um, includes a neurological assessment, electromyogram. So this is going to look at how electricity is communicating from nerves to muscles, um, nerve conduction studies, MRI studies. Um, this will be mostly for the head and spinal cord, a lumbar puncture for the cerebral spinal fluid analysis, and then a muscle biopsy to make sure that the muscles are not the problem. And in ALS, guys, the muscles are fine. It's the nerves. So what's some treatment for ALS? There's no cure. Okay, so again, just like we saw with Parkinson's and MS, there's no cure for ALS. Um, we do see that there's some drugs um, that are medications approved for slowing ALS, um, but it does not cure it. Um, stem cell therapy is something they're really looking into to see if it is a genetic thing that we can replace some cells with stem cells and potentially maybe even cure ALS. Um, antispastic agents, physical or occupational speech therapy, again with assistive devices, nutritional support. This includes high caloric foods, um, soft or pureed foods because they have difficulty swallowing and chewing, uh, thickened liquids. Uh, so when we look at this, we could also see feeding tubes may have to be put in, again, respiratory management, and then coping strategies and support. So again, when an individual is diagnosed with ALS, it's important to give support to them and their family as their, their body starts to pretty much deteriorate. All right, so our next one we want to look at is masthenia gravis. When we look at this, this is an immune condition in which the acetylcholine receptors um, are impaired or destroyed by an IgG anti autoantibodies. What happens here is the your antibodies start to attack the acetylcholine receptors on the muscles. Okay, so in that neuromuscular duction where I have the neuron talking to the muscle, in this area the receptors are being um, broken down. Okay, they're being impaired. And so because of that, when acetylcholine is released from the neuron, the muscle does not respond with um, contracting. So this disruption causes weakness of the voluntary skeletal muscles because of inadequate nerve stimulation, all right? And so on this, it's really the muscle who has the issue, but it has to do with the receptors so that the muscle does not listen to the nerves. So muscle weakness typically increases during periods of activity and then improves after periods of rest. Um, muscles that control eye or eyelid movement, facial expression, chewing, talking, and swallowing are often, but not always involved. Um, the muscles that control breathing um, and the neck and limb movements may also be affected as well because these are all skeletal muscles, so any skeletal muscle could be affected. Um, the exact trigger is unclear, uh, but the thymus gland is thought to play a role because the thymus gland is going to ultimately help with that acquired immune system, which helps develop um, with the antibodies. Um, a lot of times the autoantibodies are the ones that attack yourself, so again, this is why it's an autoimmune potential issue. Uh, factors that can worsen or cause um, what we call masthenic crisis is fatigue. So if the individual is super tired, it can actually trigger this to be worse. Illness or stress, anytime that this, again, alters or, or affects the immune system, extreme heat, alcohol consumption, and even certain medications like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, um, those types of things um, can potentially affect the muscle activity even more. Um, Mesthenia crisis is potentially life-threatening. Um, it can be a major complication where it actually starts to affect ventilation. So if they go into crisis and it ultimately affects the muscles with the breathing and we don't get them on a ventilator quickly, it can be life-threatening. So what are some manifestations? We see breathing difficulties, dysphagia, difficulty climbing stairs, lifting objects, or raising from a seated position. Um, we also see dysarthria. This is um, speech problems, drooping head, facial paralysis or weakness, fatigue, hoarseness or changing in the voice. And this has a lot to do with the breathing issue of, of sending the um, air across the vocal cords, but also the muscles who help stretch the vocal cords. Um, eye and vision issues like double vision, 
uh, ptosis, blurred vision, and difficulty maintaining gaze. So these are all examples of things that could potentially manifest, especially during the crisis stage. So again, diagnosis, history, physical exam. Um, again, the blood could be a good indicator for us on um, an issue like this since it's an immune system. So we would look at the interferon test or a serum antibody test with the blood, nerve conduction study, electromyogram, um, thymus commuted CT. So we would look at the thymus gland in a CT or MRI to see if it is um, maybe enlarged or um, swollen like through hypertrophy or something like that. Uh, treatment, again, there's no cure, um, but we can, um, again, those, there's no cure, and so we can see that they can use anti-chlorinerase um, agents. What this is, is this is the enzymes that help make sure that we don't break down the acetylcholine too quickly um, so that the receptors can still get some of the information. We may use immunosuppressive drugs, um, a thylamectomy, like taking out the thymus gland, uh, plasmapheresis, again, removing potentially some of the, the problem um, immune system cells, um, high doses of immunoglobins, proper nutrition, adequate rest, assistive devices, because um, if they have weakness in the muscles and stuff like that to help prevent falls, and if then, of course, coping strategies and support. All right, so now we're going to move on to Huntington's disease. I have a video that kind of talks a little bit about Huntington's disease for you. Um, another thing about Huntington's disease, if you ever watched House, one of his doctors, 13, she had Huntington's disease as well as her mom and even her brother. It is a hereditary disease. It's also known as Huntington's chorea. Um, this condition is genetically pre-programmed degeneration of neurons in the brain, and this is an autosomal dominant disorder, meaning that if you carry at least one of the big letters, you get Huntington's. And so if an individual carries it, they, they will pass it on to their offspring, okay, at least 50% of their offspring. Um, when we look at this, it is a defect in chromosome number four. Um, there is a repeat of a segment of a triplet of CAG in the DNA. So it gets repeated. The more times it's repeated, the worse the Huntington's is. And so if there's a lot of repeats, like massive amounts, it can have earlier onset, like we saw in a little video where the little girl who was only like six had Huntington's. Normally, though, we don't see this until later in life. Um, it's normally in their late... 20s, early 30s, they might start to start to see um, some uh, manifestations. You may not see major symptoms until they're in their 40s. Um, the repeat leads to progressive atrophy of the brain, uh, particularly in what we call the basal ganglia and the frontal cortex. Uh, the ventricles start to dilate and get larger. And you can actually see this in the picture over here where you have one side of the brain, this is what it should look like, where the other side you can see the atrophy and you can also see the ventricles getting larger. Um, we also see here that we see gamma and ambioretic acid levels start to diminish and acetylcholine levels also start to fall. So the, this whole idea of this chromosome 4 being affected, not only does it atrophy the brain, it also affects um, some of those levels of neurotransmitters and chemicals that are needed to stimulate other neurons and muscles. So as the gene is transmitted from one generation to the next, the number of repeats actually starts to increase, okay? And so if there's that line of Huntington's in the family, the more generations who have it, the worse this obviously is. The larger the number of repeats, the chance of developing the system, the, the symptoms at an earlier age increases. Again, in most cases, we see that the symptoms appear between the ages of 30 and 40 years of age, um, but again, in some cases, it can appear in childhood and in adolescence. Illness duration ranges from 10 to 30 years. So the individual, once onset of symptoms happens, they may have a life expectancy from 10 to 30 more years added on um, it, because it is a progressive disorder. Um, it most con the most common causes of death are infection, so a, like pneumonia, um, injuries related to a potential fall, and then it says other complications, but guys, one of the main complications is suicide. Um, the reason is a lot of the individuals with Huntington's disease, they have taken care of a parent or they have seen a parent go through it. And so because of that, a lot of times they choose not to go through that process. And so taking their own life, I'm not saying it's right, but this is something that they tend to do um, because they know and they see what potentially will happen to them um, in that progression of the disease. 
So guys, um, the manifestations, it's initially insidious, meaning that it's a gradual onset of those um, symptoms. It does vary from person to person. So some people, the symptoms may come on faster than others, um, but it is different from person to person. Uh, family members may report experiencing mood swings with the individual or becoming uncharacteristically irritable. The person may become apathetic passive, depressed, or even angry. Some other system, um, some other symptoms are antisocial behavior. They may start having hallucinations, paranoia, and also psychosis. Um, early signs we see with Huntington's is they have trouble driving. Um, learning new things becomes difficult. Um, remembering facts, answering questions, or even making decisions. Um, they also may have changes in their handwriting that start to take place. Um, they may begin with uncontrolled, rapid, jerky movements. This is where the Korea part comes in, where it's, it's Huntington's Korea. Um, these would be tremors, grimaces on their faces, or twitchings of their fingers, feet, face, or trunk. Um, these often will intensify when they're anxious or stressed. Um, it creates problems with their ambulation, so they have a hard time walking. Um, it does then increase their likelihood of falls, which potentially could cause traumatic brain injuries and so on. Um, they can begin with mild clumsiness, unsteady gait, and then, of course, rigidity where the muscles lock up. Symptoms may lessen as the disease progresses or may continue and include um, uh, aggression or even severe depression. And again, this is what can lead to the potential choice of suicide. Um, these individuals may also produce dementia. This can affect their judgment, memory, and a lot of their cognitive functions. Um, indications that the disease has progressed is concentration on intellectual tasks becomes more difficult. Uh, speech becomes slurred. Um, they have difficulty swallowing, eating, speaking, and walking. All that stuff starts to decline. Uh, they usually remain aware of their environment and are able to express their emotions. So even though they may not be able to talk to you, they may not be able to walk, they may not, they may be more in a, any more childlike or infant-like stage, um, they still are aware of normally what's going on around them and they can express emotion. It may be due to crying or grimacing or guarding if they're in pain, things like that. Um, but some cannot recognize their family members. It depends. It depends on whether or not the dementia sets in with it, okay? So it can ultimately potentially affect where they don't recognize their family. Now guys, Huntington's disease is a lot of times mistaken as a psychiatric disorder. Um, things like schizophrenia, bipolar, things like that because it affects a lot of times their mood, um, depression, things like that. The issue though is that it also affects the muscles causing the jerking and the chorea that's present. Um, a diagnosis is a history, a physical exam, a psychiatric evaluation to make sure and rule out other things, a genetic testing. We actually do have the genetic test for this gene. Um, if a, a parent has it, the, the children can get opted to be tested for this. Um, they can either get tested before or after the onset of symptoms, um, but again, if they get tested and they, and they have the gene, they know symptoms will begin at some point in their life. A head CT, a head MRI, and then also a head PET scan may be done as well. So again, with Huntington's, and I know this is kind of like, almost a sad thing is we're going through all these different disorders now that there's no cures for them. Um, Huntington has no cure, no treatment to stop the progression. Uh, medications may slow the progression or manage the or manage symptoms. Um, they're listed here. There's the tetrabetazine, tranquilizers, um, antipsychotic agents may help, antidepressants, uh, coenzyme QT. Um, these are all things that may help manage or slow down, but it depends again on the individual of how effective they'll be. Uh, physical, occupational, and speech therapy may be used. Coping strategies support adequate hydration, proper nutrition, and regular exercise. Um, it is under an investigation whether stem cell therapy might be helpful. Um, new medications are being developed. Um, maybe new combinations of existing medications, like maybe putting certain medications together may help slow down the process. Um, but it is a big deal. Um, it's one of those things right now that it is still progressive and there's no cure. All right, so now this brings us to dementia. Uh, dementia, guys, is a group of conditions that kind of all get kind of clumped together under this one broad term. Um, in which cortical function, which is the cerebral function, is decreased. This impairs cognitive skills and even motor co coordination. Um, this causes also issues, issues in memory loss, um, short-term memory loss, as well as confusion of even historical events. 
We also see that behavioral and personality changes start to appear. This can change relationships, um, can affect work, and even activities just in their daily living. Um, the cause, a lot of times, is this normally is like a type of vascular disease. Um, we see arthrosclerosis, infections, toxins, or even genetic conditions could potentially uh, trigger dementia. There are different types of dementia, guys. Um, some of the most common ones are listed here. There's Alzheimer's disease, uh, Creutzfeldt-Jacobs disease, and AIDS dementia complex. So these are the three we are going to talk about. So the first one with Alzheimer's disease, this is the most common form of dementia. The brain tissue starts to degenerate and um, atrophy. Okay, we actually see that it starts to get smaller. This causes a steady decline in memory and mental abilities. Um, the exact ideology of like why this happens is unknown, um, but it is associated with three pathologic characteristics. So there are three things that start to happen in somebody's brain who has Alzheimer's. The first is they develop what we call amyloid plex, uh, plaques. Um, these mix with a collection of additional proteins um, and neuron remnants. So dead neurons, um, accumulation of proteins, and these amyloid plaques, they um, all kind of form up and start to kind of gunk up the brain um, in a way. The next one is called the neurofibril tangles. This is abnormal collections of proteins called, uh, ties that clump together. Um, again, gunking up the areas in the brain, isolating neurons even more, and the more isolated a neuron, the quicker it is it will die, because neurons have to talk to other neurons. Um, connections between neurons responsible for memory and learning are lost. Um, neurons cannot survive when their connections to other neurons are lost, okay? And so when we look at this, these plaques and these tangles start to separate the neurons, which then causes them to die, which creates more plaques and more tangles, which then affects more neurons. And so it's a vicious cycle that's taking place in their brain. Um, this is not part of the normal aging process, guys, um, but as you age, you are at a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's. Um, the rates are higher in women. Um, rates may be higher in persons with less education for some unknown reason. Okay, we don't know why, um, but they do feel that they do see that it is more common in those with less education. Additional risk factors, of course, are family history because we do believe there is maybe a genetic basis to this. Hypertension hypercholesteremia, diabetes, and a history of potential of traumatic brain injury. Uh, prevalence and mortality rates are on the rise. And guys, one thing with this is because now it has a name. Um, I think that Alzheimer's has kind of been around for a long time, uh, but they just thought that the patients were kind of crazy. Um, they weren't, it wasn't termed as Alzheimer's. And so we see that prevalence, it's more common now because we now know what it is and what, um, we now know kind of like its manifestations and signs. And of course, mortality rates are going to go higher because more people that we know have it, and as they die, it starts to increase. Um, some complications from, from Alzheimer's is infections, primarily pneumonia, urinary tract infections, um, injuries related to falls, malnutrition, um, and a lot of times this is because they forget to eat. Um, they, don't, they just forget that they need to eat. And then when they are being taken care of, um, as it progresses, they also um, lose the ability to swallow. Dehydration and then, of course, ulcers. Because as they become immobile, it potentially puts them at higher risk for ulcers. Um, Alzheimer's has an insidious onset. It comes on um, slowly over time. Um, it may last from 10 to 20 years. Um, my grandmother had it for about uh, 15 years uh, before she, she um, ultimately died last January. Um, when we look at this, guys, it does have progressions. Um, we see that there's kind of early stages of Alzheimer's. Um, which would be like mild uh, symptoms, and then they can compress. They and then they um, progress, and to where they become a more extreme type of um, issues. So when we're looking at this, guys, um, the manifestations include confusion, memory loss, problems with abstract thinking, um, difficulty finding the right words to express their thoughts, or to even follow in a conversation. 
Um, they'll have difficulty reading and writing, disorientation, even with a familiar setting like their own home, they get disoriented. A loss of judgment, difficulty performing familiar tasks, personality changes, hallucinations, and incontinence of the bowel and bladder. So when we look at these guys, there is a progression that takes place. Um, the first thing that starts to go on the individual when they start developing Alzheimer's is short-term memory loss. Okay, so they forget that they've eaten, um, they forget that they need to eat lunch, they forget things that are um, short-term type of things. Um, the next thing is the second step when we go to moderate. Um, moderate is where we see the confusion stage. This is where they have disorientation, lack of insight. Um, this can cause decreased hygiene, uh, decreased language. Um, also something called sundown syndrome. So when the, and it actually is like related to the sun, when the sun starts to go down, their personality changes and things like that happen. Um, the third is the very severe um, stage. In this, we see that incontinence becomes an issue where they don't control their bladder or bowel. Um, we see inability to recognize family and friends. And so because of that, then they pretty much don't recognize anybody. Um, this is also the stage a lot of times where you'll see hallucinations come into play. They become immobile. They stop eating. And so this is the part that ultimately leads to their death. Um, Guys, this is a very difficult disease, um, not only for the person who's going through it, but also for their family and the potential caregivers. Um, it's very important that these people um, receive adequate care, and that's what's hard sometimes is when they're put in homes, they're not um, given that care. They're kind of, they are on a progression to potentially death, but that does not mean that they can't have a good life during that time. Um, uh, it's very interesting to have seen my grandmother kind of go through this. It's really sad. Um, it was not something that I really wanted to see happen. But as we went through the progression, at first she was very good at hiding that she was having issues. Um, she was a very friendly woman to begin with. And so because of that, she just kind of hugged and loved on everybody, even though she really didn't recognize them. She compensated pretty well, of like not being able to count out money. Um, she would just give the cashier money until the, the cashier would finally move her hand or say, oh no, you gave me too much um, when she would go to the store. Um, she was a great cook and she just quit being able to cook. Um, she would forget really important things on recipes that, that she did all the time. Um, so there was a lot of issues like that. Um, once it became an issue where she, my papa couldn't help take care of her by himself, my parents moved in with them. Um, and then my grandma would have hallucinations. She thought a little boy sat in a certain chair and if you sat in that chair, oh, she would throw fits. Um, she would talk to her mom and her mom had died when she was like 20 years old. Um, and so when we look at that, there was a lot of things that were happening, um, that progressed. Um, she quit being able to take care of herself, um, dress herself. Um, feed herself, um, even be able to walk, that sort of thing. And so it was a decline um, that took place. And finally, it just was where she couldn't swallow or really do anything. And she had a living will that stated that she didn't want a feeding tube and stuff. And so um, that progression, though, did take about 15 years. My parents lived with my grandpa for um, seven years, helping take care of her. Okay, and so um, this is something that really the individuals who help take care of them need some help as well. So let's look here at the brain scan. If we notice over here on the um, right side of the screen is a normal brain. On the left side of the screen is an Alzheimer's brain. You can see how it's atrophied. It's a lot smaller. Um, you start to see that the um, sulci, which are the, the, the divots in the brain, are getting way deeper because the brain tissue is, is dying. It's just not there. All right, and so this is just showing you the progression. And this picture is found in your textbook on page 371. Um, another thing, guys, is this is a functional MRI, sorry, a functional PET scan um, of the brain. Um, again, on the on the left side, it's showing you a normal brain. Um, this is how the brain has metabolism and perfusion when a normal brain is active. Um, on the right side, on brain B, this is one with the atrophy and the brain activity in somebody who has Alzheimer's. The brain is just not functioning at any kind of capacity that it should, and you also notice that it's a lot smaller in size as well. So diagnosis, guys, is often difficult. Um, it often involves ruling out other conditions. Um, when we look at this too, is it's also going to be progressive where the individual may be able to do certain things in early visits with the doctor, but then they start to progress and not be able to do those things later on. History of physical exam, again, this is a neurological assessment, but also a mental status evaluation. This would be things like asking the patient what their birthday is, um, what their full name is, what year is it, what day is it, what how to read a clock. Um, 
remembering like a sequence of um, words that are given to the patient and then they need to be given back to the, the nurse or the doctor at a certain point. Um, head CTs, head MRIs, uh, PET scans, things like that to help look at the atrophy of the brain. All right, guys, with treatment, there's no cure for Alzheimer's disease, um, nor are there any therapies that will actually slow down the progression. There are some medications that look like they could be promising of slowing it down, but this disease all will plateau at certain points anyways. We see that there'll be like a de decrease in, in function and then it kind of plateaus for a while and then it decreases again. And this could be related to medications, but it could just be the progression of the disease. Um, there's not really anything that slows it down yet. Um, a lot of the medications are just to manage symptoms and to also maximize the functioning of the individual's life. Um, so here is a list of just different types of medications. Um, and then there's also some that are more um, natural like vitamin E and ginkgo. Um, other strategies, though, are memory aids, like giving calendars, um, reminders, things like that to the patient. Nutritional support, making sure they have good nutrition when they do eat. Physical exercise, uh, cognitive activities, so like puzzles, things like that to try to help keep them active. Safety precautions, um, it's very important that these people have a lot of supervision. Um, they will do things that are kind of crazy that you wouldn't think an adult would do. Um, my grandma would go and turn on the um, stoves and touch them and they're hot and you would think you tell her oh it's hot don't touch it but she still would so we had to take the 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 little knobs that turn the stoves on and lock them up so that she couldn't turn them on um, they will also a lot of times um, they need supervision because they'll leave they don't realize that that's their home or anything anymore and they'll just leave and then they get lost um, so again at, at my parents house they would have the lock that has the little key entry or the number entry to unlock the door but it was backwards okay the key part pad part was inside the house so that my grandma couldn't put in the code to get out so that that would help keep her in um, removing clutter because a lot of times they don't realize they need to step over things or things like that and it can cause them to fall um, maintaining a calm environment if my grandma was stressed she would act out um, and sometimes she would act out violently she kicked some caregivers she would kind of fight up my mom. Um, so trying to keep them calm is important, but sometimes it's not something that can be done. Um, continuing to have social interactions. Now this is hard um, because they don't make a lot of sense. Um, it was very hard to try to talk to my grandma because she's not carrying on a real conversation with you. Um, she would just start making noises and sounds at some point, didn't make any sense of any kind of talk. And then other times when it would really progress, she'd just stare at you. But it is still important that they have social interaction. They don't need to be shut off and completely left to just be by themselves. It is important for them to have social interaction. Uh, coping strategies are important, and this is not just for the patient, but this is for the caregivers, the people who are going to be left behind to take care of them, um, being able to cope with what's going on and also a lot of support. Another example of dementia is what we call uh, creutzfeldt jakob disease. This one is a very rare um, type, but it is rapidly progressing form of dementia. It's caused by an infectious puron. Now guys, the puron is very unique because it's an infectious protein. This is where a protein misfolds and then it causes other proteins to misfold. An issue with this though is that it comes a lot of times from contaminated meat. And even if you cook the meat, you can't kill this because it's a protein. It's not a bacteria, it's not a virus, it's a protein. So cooking the meat well done does not get rid of this. Um, this is pretty much, this a puron is something that is in mad cow disease. So when cows are found out to have mad cow disease, we can't butcher them and feed them to people because this is potentially what could happen. So that's what we're looking at with a puron. The puron is resistant to sterilization and disinfection. It has a long incubation period. You could be exposed to it in um, contaminated meat and you may not have any issues with it for up to 40 years, okay, after, after that. Um, however, CG, CJD is rapidly progressing and it's always fatal. It's usually within one year of when we see the onset of the symptoms. So you could live with it for 40 years, but once the symptoms start, it's normally about one year. So there are two different types. There's the classic version. This is not related to bovine spongiform encephaly or mad cow disease. Okay, so the classic form does not come from um, bovine spongiform, which is meaning it comes from mad cow disease. Um, the variant form is related to this. And so if you were to eat contaminated cow meat, um, that's the variant form. Because the classical form comes from eating 
individuals or humans that have been infected to this. This is a form of cannibalism. And this is seen in some, even some tribes today, um, especially in areas like um, New Guinea or um, um, Aborigines or in areas like in the Amazon. Um, it's part of their religion that when an individual in the family dies that they consume certain parts of that person's body and that includes the brain and normally the heart. The brain is what's infected though so if that individual is infected with that and then you have to eat their brain in order for them to move into the afterlife then you just infected yourself with it. And so um, as modern medicine has um, kind of revealed this and, and, and knows the cause, we try to go in and educate these people, but sometimes their religion is so inbred that they can't, they feel like they can't stop that because they don't want their loved one not to potentially cross over or whatever it is based on eating those, those parts of the body. So when we look at this too, there's some main categories. There's what we call the sporadic. This is the most common form of classic. This is caused by spontaneous transformation of a normal prion protein into an abnormal prion. So what happens is, is a normal protein just spontaneously changes into an abnormal one. There's also the hereditary. This is a rare form and it occurs with an abnormal protein that's, that is inherited. And then there's the acquired. Again, this is rare and it occurs when exposed to infected materials. So this is like, could be even due to via tissue transplant or ingestion if you were to eat this. So manifestations are blurred vision, ataxia, hallucinations, um, lack of coordination, muscle twitching, myoclonic jerks or seizures, spasticity, anxiety, personality changes, uh, confusion and disorientation, lethargy, and speech impairment. Again, with physical, um, with diagnosis, we need to do history, physical exam, um, electroencephalogram, head, head MRI, other tests, other forms of dementia. So we would look at lumbar puncture, there's a serum test to see if we can locate the puron. Okay, so that's one thing we're looking at because it does have the same manifestations a lot of times as like Alzheimer's, but it is a lot more fastly progressing. All right, so again, here's kind of an example of the brain when we look at the uh, Cradfelt Jacobs disease. Um, this particular picture is found on your book on page 370. Too. And again, you can see the atrophy of the brain. You can see the ventricles getting um, larger over here on the right side. So treatment, again, there's no cure. Interleukins and other immunomodular agents can maybe slow the progression. Um, there's custodial care in the sense of helping just take care of the individual. Medications to control aggression behavior, spasticity, pain, or seizures. Again, providing a safe environment, controlling aggressive and agitated behavior, and um, meeting their physiological needs, like eat, feeding them, hygiene, things like that. Again, family counseling may be something that would be helpful with this because of the way that this could progress and maybe have a hereditary basis. The next one is AIDS dementia complex. This, of course, is going to be when HIV invades the brain tissue. This may be exacerbated by opportunistic infections and tumors that are associated with AIDS. Um, some manifestations are encephalitis, behavioral changes, and gradual decline of cognitive function. Um, this is trouble concentrating, memory, and attention. We also have a progressive slowing of motor function with a loss of dexterity, so not being able to be as agile with movements, things like that, and coordination. Um, it can cause mental retardation and delayed motor development in congenital HIV. So if a child is born with HIV due to it being passed on from the mother, it could potentially cause delay in development or even retardation in the child. Um, so there is a staging system to describe the progression of AIDS dementia. Um, zero is normal and four is a nearly vegetative state due to um, the dementia. Diagnosis, of course, is history, physical exam, um, head CT, head MRI, and a biopsy. And this is to help prove that the, um, AIDS, the HIV virus is in the brain tissue. It can be fatal if it's untreated. Um, treatment is aggressive um, antiretroviral therapy. So guys, it's the same kind of um, antiviral um, treatment for AIDS itself. Um, it's to help fight the HIV infection, to prevent it from replicating, prevent it from invading the tissues and that sort of thing, but to be very aggressive with this in order to help keep it out of the brain. All right, and so that's what we're looking at with the types of dementias. Okay, now the last little thing where we're talking about brain um, kind of disorders um, here will be brain tumors. 
Uh, brain tumors may be malignant, malignant or benign. Um, in brain tumors can be life-threatening because they do cause increased intracranial pressure, um, and they are difficulty difficult to access in order to treat and to potentially remove. Um, they may be primary, uh, meaning that they started in the brain, um, but most are secondary tumors, most commonly coming from breast cancer, colon cancer, kidney cancer, lung cancer, melanomas, or sarcomas, where some of the cells break off, enter the bloodstream, and then embed in the brain and start to grow. And so that's what we're kind of looking at here with secondary tumors. Um, again, here's a picture that shows you some brain tumors um, in a brain, um, and you can look, see them located and see how they put pressure on the brain tissue itself, and again, causing... Um, herniation of the brain into new areas that they shouldn't go. Now guys, primary tumors are thought to rise from genetic mutations. Um, risk factors for primary tumors, of course, are advancing age and exposure to radiation, as well as maybe some occupational chemicals um, in the job that you may do. Uh, prevalence and mortality rates are highest among Caucasians and males. Complications, again, are neurological deficits, seizures, personality changes, and de death due to the increased intracranial pressure. Um, the manifestations, they vary depending on the size of the tumor and also its location, um, but some of these may include new onset or changes in patterns of, or headaches, um, headaches at increasing frequency and severity, unexplained nausea or vomiting. And guys, these are not only the, the first things. We see that um, they have these headaches that are constantly coming in and they're getting worse and worse. Um, this nausea and vomiting when they don't have any kind of infection or anything like that. Vision problems, gradual loss of sensations or movements in an extremity. Again, it depends on the area the tumor is found. Uh, balance difficulties, speech difficulties, confusion, hearing problems, and even hormonal um, disorders. Um, because the endocrine system and the neurological system are connected, if the, the tumor is in a place that ultimately could affect hormone releases like the hypothalamus or near the pituitary gland. Diagnosis history, physical exam, um, a head MRI. We would take a biopsy to see if it's benign or malignant. Um, other tests also determine the cancer histology. Where did the cells come from? Is it a secondary tumor or a primary tumor? Um, the treatment's going to depend on the size and the location. Um, if it can be removed, they will remove it surgically. Um, the patient still will undergo radi radiation and chemotherapy to help make sure that they got all the cancer or to reduce the size if it cannot be removed. Um, rehabilitation may include physical therapy, occupational therapy, or speech therapy, and this is normally due to the damage from the intracranial pressure or herniation from the tumor being present in the area of the brain. All right, the last little bit of our notes here are going to be the neurobiology of psychotic illnesses, okay? So we're going to be looking now at the psychotic side. All right, so when we look at mental illness, women are twice as likely to suffer from depression and anxiety disorders than men. Um, this very likely could be linked to a biological basis, um, hormone levels, things like that, and also the vulnerability with conditions of a woman's life. So things like marital status, work, um, and roles in society because a lot of women do work outside the home now, whereas before they didn't. Exposure to sexual abuse and assault, and also physical violence. Um, gender differences could also be in um, the HPA axis. Um, this is the hypo, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, which deal, ac, um, axis which deals with hormone levels. Uh, serotonin receptors in the brain and also reproductive hormones because women have that cycle of reproductive hormones and then also when a woman hits in menopause, those hormones just cease to be produced. And so this tends to make them at a higher risk for potentially some of these mental illnesses. Um, there are also a lot of cultural considerations when it comes to mental illness. Um, it's always important to respect a person's cultural um, background um, when you are treating them um, because every kind of cultural background has different ways of how they view modern medicine and how they view it as maybe being useful. This also can sometimes determine when they come in to receive treatment, whether they, they come in early when symptoms start or later when symptoms start. So this does not just include psychiatric disorders, but almost any kind of disorder. Order. but there are known differences in how cultures and regions around the world view mental health especially um, and how they also express concerns about the body self and emotions and so 
there is something that we call cultural bound syndromes that come into play with psychiatric disorders. Um, these are going to be sets of symptoms much more common in some societies than in others um, because of the cultural constraints that come with um, the way they think of mental illness. Um, mental illness is normally considered the product of a complex interaction. Um, this is among the biological side of the body, the uh, psycho psychological side, but also cultural side. Um, culture can influence um, info, um, information and symptoms that the patient gives you or provides to you and shares with you. It also can affect how and when they seek help with certain mental disorders. Um, also how they're going to have coping strategies for them. Um, social support, sometimes they don't have any social support because they don't, their culture may not think that mental illness is really a real thing. Um, and there's also that stigma that comes along a lot of times with mental illness. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these mental illnesses real quick. So one is schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is also known as a split mind. It's a split or separation among normal, well-synchronized brain function. So this results in thoughts, behaviors, and feelings that are disordered, uh, disorganized, or disconnected from reality. And so this is why we would call it a type of psychosis. It's characterized by altered perceptions of reality and disordered thinking. Um, so when we take a look at this, um, in the U.S. population, about 1% of people have schizophrenia. Um, the fir it's first diagnosed typically between the ages of 15 and 54 years of age. Um, women usually have symptoms that come around the ages of 25 to 35. Men start to have onset of symptoms usually around the ages of 15 to 25 years of age. Um, women tend to have better outcomes um, with treatment and stuff with schizophrenia. Um, the cause of schizophrenia is normally genetic and, vir and environmental, um, but it's really unknown exactly what can trigger or cause schizophrenia. But we do believe that it does have a genetic and environmental basis. So when we look at clinical manifestations of schizophrenia, there's a number of different um, ways to look at these symptoms. One way is to look at positive symptoms versus negative symptoms. Now, positive symptoms, guys, are symptoms that are added to the person's personality. Okay, so positive means it's added. Um, so these are normally like reality distortion or disorganization type of symptoms. A lot of times this results from excessive dopamine D2 receptor activity. So these certain receptors in the brain are overactive. And so because of this, it causes distortions in thoughts, um, like delusions. And so when we look at delusions, guys, these are false ideas. And so they think people are like spying on them or um, that they may think that they're famous. Um, these are what we call systematic or fixed or false beliefs. They usually involve things of themes of like persecution. Um, again, like they're being spied on or paranoia, um, reference, somatization. They think that they are a famous person or a famous religious leader or something like that. Um, we also see that there's distortions of perception. These are hallucinations. These are sensory perceptions with no apparent stimulus. So this could be auditory where they hear voices. It could be visual where they see things, olfactory where they smell, taste, um, is gustatory or tactile touch. But guys, auditory is the most common where again, they feel like they are hearing voices, um, giving them commands or comments. They also can have disorganized thinking and speech. This is characterized by frequent derailment or loose associations. Um, inverted words, um, civil speech altogether. Um, so guys, a lot of times heroes, they may start to associate things that don't really matter um, or they may repeat statements that don't make any kind of sense, expecting you to kind of figure out what they're really kind of talking about. So there's disorganization in their speech. Again, with positive symptoms, they can also have reality uh, distortion or disorganization. This is grossly disorganized behavior. So this could range from childlike silliness, where it's an adult and they act really silly like a child, to unpredictive agitation. Um, this can impair their tasks of daily living. We also see that they could have catatonic motor behaviors, decreased reactivity to environmental events, um, this could cause such an extreme that they have rigid posture and they resist efforts of you trying to move them. So it's like they just refuse to be part of the situation. They're taking themselves out of it. They're becoming rigid, catatonic in the sense that they do not respond to any kind of stimulus that's around them. 
On the other hand, um, we can see that they can have negative symptoms. Negative symptoms are things that are lost from the person's personality. They're things that have been taken away from their personality. Um, this is a reflect of decrease or deficit or loss of normal function. Um, it's considered to be a restricted effect. Um, a lot of times here, guys, again, it's a dopamine receptor, but now it's a dopamine D1 receptor activity. Um, these manifestations include social withdrawal, okay? That's where the A societal comes in. If they're withdrawing socially, um, they're wanting to be isolated. They may have dull or blunted emotional effect, um, poverty of speech. They just don't talk. Um, they're posturing. Um, they may seem to have what looks like autism, okay, where they don't want to make eye contact or anything like that. And these would be what we would consider negative effects, where things have been taken from their personality. Some other um, clinical manifestations are decreased cognitive functioning. They may have impaired higher cognitive functioning, like uh, problems with attention. They may not have good long-term memory. Um, working memory is hindered. Um, abstraction and planning doesn't take place. Language comprehension and production could be altered. Um, so these are some just some clinical signs for schizophrenia. Some clinical manifestations that also could take place is affect. This is emotional tone. Their uh, voice has, lacks all emotion whatsoever. It's blunted, shallow, flat, inappropriate, or even silly in the way that they answer. Um, loss of emotional tone, which is unchanging. Um, inexpressive facial expressions. Lack, again, of eye contact. A few gestures. Literal no tone or inflection in speech. Um, and hedionia is the absence of pleasure or interest. They just don't care. It's a, a lack of being engaged. They may feel little pleasure, pleasure from pleasurable experiences or may no longer engage in pleasurable experiences at all. Okay, and so a lot of this, guys, is just withdrawing away um, from the real world, in a sense. So how do we diagnose schizophrenia? It's characterized by two or more of the following symptoms. They have to have delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, grossly abnormal psychomotor behavior, or negative symptoms. They have to have at least one of these that is delusional, hallucinations, or disorganized speech. The other one can come from any of these, but they have to have at least one of the delusion, hallucinations, or disorganized speech, and at least one other one. Um, this schizophrenia can cause a significant disruption in work, interpersonal relationships, and self-care. And so it's really important for the individual to potentially be treated. Um, another thing we have to look at is dopamine effects. Um, dopamine is a culprit here, and we see decreased neurotransmission and conducti conductivity. Um, Excessive or subcortical dopaminergic transmission at the dopamine D2 receptors can be a problem. We also see deficiency in glutamate transmission um, in what we call the NMDA receptors. So this could be, again, dopamine issue or glutamate issue. Um, disordered synaptic organization, so brain-derived uh, neurotrophic factors can increase synaptic activity and neurotransmitter output in some areas. Um, there could be some genetic effects for schizophrenia. Children of two parents with schizophrenia have 40 to 68% higher risk of developing the illness than people who have two normal parents with no schizophrenia. Uh, developmental factors such as prenatal infections, malnutrition, birth complications, and brain injury can also be associated um, with these genetic risks. So when we look at this, guys, if the mother um, has some of those prenatal infections we talked about, the mother's malnourished, the, the baby had birth complications like during the birthing process, um, all these things could potentially trigger those genetic effects for schizophrenia. So now how do we treat it? Um, there is some uh, drug treatment that is out there. Um, drugs can block the D1 um, this is clozapine. It's used to help take care of the negative system symptoms because it's a D1 blocker. Uh, D2 remains the lead neurotransmitter target of what we call atypical antipsychotics. Um, certain kind of drugs, they're to target the D2. Uh, new medications aim to stabilize rather than reduce dopamine activity. So instead of reducing it, they want to help try to stabilize it. Um, there are a few of these, like aeropropazole or zero, zero, ziprazidone. 
They share greater affinity for serotonin receptors and moderate affinity of dopamine and or norepinephrine. So these potentially could be some new medications that could um, we could see a rise with treatment in schizophrenia. Um, there are some side effects, though, of these drug treatments. Um, the metabolic side effects of the new atypical antipsychotic medication could be significant, and this could include weight gain, glucose dysregulation, and dyslipidemia, meaning that it disrupts the, the lipid digestion, the uh, amount of lipids in the blood starts to increase. We also see that the glutamate deficit model may be the basis for the next generation of antipsychotic medications. This is a hypothesis of a new way for treatment because right now the first generation agents that are used to really treat schizophrenia right now were developed in the 1950s. These first generation um, agents cause extra pyramidal side effects like EPS. This causes rigidity in the body, uh, bradykinesia, so it's the slow movements, um, dystonias, tremors, and um, acathesia, meaning where it stops movements. Um, we also see that it could cause um, a side effect of tardivia dyskinesia, which is involuntary movements in the face and the extremities. And so since these drugs were developed in the 1950s, this new hypothesis with the glutamate deficit model may be able to help counteract some of these more severe side effects um, with these new medications. But again, with new medications, new side effects could come up that we haven't seen as people start to take them. The next disease we want to look at is bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder has reoccurring symptoms of depression and elation that can become severe enough to produce a type of psychosis. Um, mania is the hallmark symptom for bipolar disorder. Um, when initial symptoms of mania are significant enough to produce psychosis, bipolar may be mistaken as schizophrenia. Um, in children, it presents as irritability, cynical mood changes, and associated attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity, so ADHD. Um, some clinical manifestations of bipolar disorder, there's, there's two main types, guys. Um, there's a bipolar one, and they have at least one episode of mania as well as major depression. Bipolar two is no episodes of mania. They have at least one episode of what we call hypomania. It's almost like mania, but they haven't quite gotten there to that high, high end yet. But they also still develop major depression. Hallucinations and delusions can occur with the psychosis that typically develops with severe prolonged mania. So what is mania? Mania is an abnormal or persistently elevated, expansive, or irritable mood. And so when we look at mania, guys, it's where they have like a super high and then the depression start is a super low. So this is why it's called bipolar disorder because you have the two extremes. During a, a mania type of um, episode, they have inflated self-esteem. Um, they have these visions of grandeur for themselves. Um, they have this self-appraised importance. They um, have this these claims of limited expertise. They just talk about things they really don't know anything about. Um, they may have insulting put downs. They can reach even delusional proportions. And this is why a lot of times it kind of hinges on where they think that the individual might have had schizophrenia. Okay, but it's that high mania side. Um, another manifestation that we can see during mania is decreased need for sleep. They feel like they don't need to sleep. They don't sleep very much. Increased talkativeness or pressure to keep talking. Uh, flight or ideas of subjective experience that their thoughts are just racing constantly. They're distracted. Um, they have increased goal-directed activities. So this actually is beneficial in social work, school, or even sexual side um, where they're very goal-oriented. Um, and they also, though, can have psychomotor agitation. Um, excessive involvement of pleasurable activities, that can happen high in that um, mania type. This has high potential for painful long-term consequences. Um, unrestrained, uh, this could be unrestrained buying sprees where they just shop like crazy, spending tons of money, they have multiple sexual partners without any care of protection, things like that. Um, so this is going to be where they feel like they're invincible almost in a sense um, during these mania stages. Um, difference between hypomania and mania is the difference is the severity and the duration. Hypomanic symptoms persist for four days or more. 
instead of about seven. A lot of times with mania, you see about seven days where they're in a mania. Hypomania does not include psychosis or impaired functioning. Hypomania is a sudden onset of increased energy, expanded self-esteem, and decreased anxiety. Um, the individual believes, believes have improved productivity and has a natural high. Okay, but they don't really necessarily reach that super, super high where they feel like they're like invincible. They just are actually working better. Their self-esteem is improved. They're not as stressed and that sort of thing in a hypomania state. So when we look at bipolar disorder, um, the etiology and neurobiology, the risk of developing this disorder is inherited and in acquired. So you can have a genetic and environmental factor here. Neurotransmission activity deficits promote depression symptoms. Excessive activity promotes symptoms of mania and psychosis. So when the neurotransmission is um, hindered one way or the other, you may have the depression stage or you have the mania stage. Impaired emotion processing and impaired regulation of emotional behavior are the probable neurological or neurobiological mechanisms. Um, for bipolar disorder, there is some uh, drug treatment. Uh, before diagnosis and treatment, the uh, possibility of a primary medical condition or drug reaction as the cause of depression, elation, mania, or psychosis should be considered. However, um, a lot of times people, when they have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, they are put on mood stabilizers. This could be things like lithium, anticonvulsants, and atypical antipsychotics. Um, but again, guys, it's really important that they rule out things like schizophrenia, especially if they have bipolar disorder one, uh, before they start treatment for um, bipolar disorder. So guys, some geriatric considerations, uh, psychiatric admissions of older individuals, significantly more uh, major depression that you see as people get older um, um, than you see with the younger, um, extremely rare for bipolar to emerge after the age of 60. Um, they may suffer side effects such, such as the tardive uh, dyskinesia from anti-psychotic uh, drugs. Um, antidepressants prescribed at lower dosages for geriatric patients. They get titrated um, upward more slowly depending on if they need more. They're going to take slower steps to get to the level that a geriatric patient may need um, for their antipsychotic medication. So now guys let's look at the non-psychotic illnesses. Um, these are going to be more like your panic attacks and um, OCD. So anxiety disorders are characterized by irrational uh, debilitating fears. They're irrational, meaning that there's no real reason to fear those things. And um, you get, you're so fearful of them, it actually causes you not to be able to function. There's four major categories of anxiety disorders. The first is panic disorders, generalized anxiety disorders, excessive compulsive disorder, and post-traumatic stress syndrome. Okay, so these are the four categories. In panic disorders, you have acute episodes of anxiety um, symptoms that are unexpected, sudden, recurrent, and they generate intense feelings of fear. Um, the anticipatory anxiety is that fearful expectation of panic that starts to come on. Avoidance is often used as a personal strategy to increase feelings of control and decrease risk of panic attacks. So a lot of times, guys, if they know, if you know what could potentially cause the panic attack, they stay away from it. They avoid it. Okay. And this is, again, irrational fear when we look at this. And so um, because of this, it causes them to go into a panic attack. So again, avoiding the trigger is um, the, their main coping strategy. So when we look at a panic disorder, there are physical symptoms. They get dyspnea, palpitations, tachycardia, chest pain, dizziness, numbness, trembling, sweating, hyperventilation. Okay, so again, their body goes into fight or flight. Their breathing starts to increase. It gets irregular. Their heart starts to beat and cause palpitations. Tachycardia could cause chest pain. So all these are going to be manifestations of going into a panic um, from a fight or flight. Um, we also see that they express fear of dying, impending doom, losing control, derealization, depersonalization that takes place. This is the psychological symptoms. Behavioral system, sy symptoms may be hyperkinesis. They start to move um, more quickly. Uh, pressured speech, exaggerated startle response where they just will jump at any little thing. Attacks may last for five minutes to 30 minutes. So panic can, ta can happen pretty, onset can happen very quickly and it could last for as little as five minutes, but up to 30 minutes. 
How do we treat panic disorders? Um, we can use cognitive behavior therapy. This is aimed at reducing fearful thinking and desensitization. So with this, it may put them in, and expose them to what they're potentially scared of and to desensitize them. Um, Long-acting uh, benzozytopenes. These are going to help with some antidepressants that might help um, control the panic disorder. Beta blockers may also be used um, for their anxiety problems. Generalized anxiety disorders is where worry is chronic and persistent as well as physical anxiety symptoms. Um, this one is not going to be necessarily one in particular thing that causes them to become panicked. It's more of a general thing. A uh, persistent worry may lead to multiple symptoms that includes restlessness, fatigue, impaired concentration, irritability, muscle tension, muscle pain, and disturbed sleep. Um, some clinical manifestations of general anxiety disorders is physical symptoms may vary widely, um, including muscle tension, um, lightheadedness, sweating, palpitations, stomach distress, which could potentially lead to ulcers, chronic headaches. Um, some psychological symptoms include uncontrollable worry with no areas of life excluded. So they worry about every little part of their life. Uh, behavior symptoms include sleep disturbances and then, of course, fatigue. Um, the next one we want to look at is excessive compulsive disorder. Um, this is persistent involuntary thoughts that provoke anxiety and involuntary anxiety management rituals. Um, so they have these things that cause them to have these thoughts that provoke them to be anxious and then they do these rituals to help manage that anxiety but then if they don't follow through with them correctly then it contributes to their anxiety. Um, typically patients strive to avoid disclosing these symptoms. Lifetime OCD prevalence rate for the general population is about 2.2%, whereas the risk for first degree relatives is about 9.2%. So if you're the first person in the family to have OCD, it's normally about 2.2% of the population. But if you have relatives that have it, there's a higher chance at 9.2%. So again, clinical manifestations, obsessions are strong, um, persistent, intrusive, uncontrollable thoughts. Um, compulsions, on the other hand, are the repetitive ritualistic actions that you perform with urgency. Typically, um, they're related to the obsessions. Concern about dirt and contamination are a big thing. Um, counting may be something that they do. And then a third, uh, third group that is purely obsessional is with no compulsion. So they just have the obsessive part, but no compulsion part when we look at that. Um, so this is affected persons are unable to stop, govern, or resist their obsession or their compulsion. They have to do it. Um, there's four constant syndromes here. Symmetry and order are part of that. Okay, so they have to have symmetry and order in situations like color coding, same thing on each side, stuff like that. Uh, contamination and cleaning, where they feel like if they get dirty or any way, they have to clean the area compulsively. Um, they may have hoarding, where they feel like they have to hold on to everything. And then what we call also obsessions and checking. They obsess about something and they also have to check to make sure that um, the status of it hasn't changed. Um, my husband has some excessive compulsive disorder. He likes things to have symmetry and order, um, but he also has the obsessive checking. Um, if he feels like he did not shut the garage door, he has to go back and check. Even when he's checked and he's seen that it's closed, if he starts driving down the street again and he has that obsession that he didn't check it, he has the compulsion to have to go check again. And so that can be very distracting and so if he feels like he if he doesn't go check it out he feels wrong he says it just feels wrong inside of him uncertainty is the hallmark of the compulsion um, it results from a discrepancy between sensory information and internal beliefs even though they see it they feel it they hear it they're internally they cannot believe that that's really what they are seeing hearing or feeling again there's probably a strong genetic or inherited risk that come with this increase in glucose metabolism rates in the frontal lobe quadrate nucleus and what we call the centrogyric gyrus regions um, are present in individuals who have excessive pulsive disorder. Uh, treatment is exposure therapy and response prevention. So again, exposing them to their issue over and over and um, preventing them from doing their rituals. 
cognitive behavior therapy is used in conjunction with medication management. Um, so they may have medications that help keep them calm. High doses of anti-anxiety, -anxi antidepressants, atypical antipsychotics, and even beta blockers may be used. Uh, tricyclic antidepressants or anticonvulsants that we call the uh, gabapentin are also helpful for people with a very debilitating excessive compulsive disorder. Now the last disorder that was not talked about was post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, a lot of times with post-traumatic stress what happens there is the individual has had something that causes um, them to have to worry. I mean it's something that has hurt them or hurt somebody around them and so because of that um, they have these feelings of an ease that come up in relation to that. Um, they may feel like they need to constantly check on somebody or not let somebody travel or there's a lot of different things that can come into play but again it's still irrational. It's not something that they need to really worry about but they do. Um, I believe we'll talk about post-traumatic stress syndrome in another chapter in this book um, but these are just some of the different things when we look at the psychological side um, that is important to look at besides just the neurological um, issues when we look at demyelination or trauma or things like that. Um, I hope that these notes really help you and they'll help you prepare for your exam. Um, again, you can watch them as much as you want and I'm sorry that it's so long, but this chapter is super long and has lots of stuff that are really good and helpful. Um, hopefully again too that these notes may help you with your um, class assignment and if you do have any questions or concerns, please feel free to email me and contact me throughout the um, next week or so.